Hello, uh, very good afternoon uh, to you all. In fact, we are almost approaching evening now uh, that it's five nearly. We are here to uh, begin the Young Researchers International Webinar on the evolution of Bengali identity, reflections in literature, culture, and society. This uh, is the first day, and we will have more sessions on 11th and 12th of October as well. Uh, we, start, we, we are starting at 5 to today, but from tomorrow we will start at 4. Uh, this uh, webinar is being organized by Postscriptum, an interdisciplinary journal of literary studies, which is an online open access peer reviewed journal, which is indexed in Doaj. Uh, and it is a publication of the Department of English, Sharad Centenary College, Dhaniakali, Hooghly. So uh, before going into the uh, webinar uh, uh, proper, let me just uh, discuss a little bit about why we are talking about this evolution thing about Bengali identity. 2020 being the year of 200th uh, birth anniversary of Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar, one of the pioneers of Bengal Renaissance, this webinar proposes to map the evolution of Bengali identity during these last 200 years, the pluralities and the multiplicities that have often outgrown the linguistic and geographical dimensions. This webinar will also focus on the cultural, social, religious, and political events that have impacted upon Bengali identity during the la last 200 year journey through which our identity has evolved since the Bengal Renaissance. When talking about Bengal Renaissance, let, let me quote from uh, Amit Shen, which is the pen name of Shushavan Sharkar. He wrote in his book, uh, uh, Notes on Bengal Renaissance, which was published in 1946. He was trying to fix a date where Bengal Renaissance actually started. And I quote, the easiest point, starting point is, of course, the date 1814, when Ram Mohan Roy settled down in Calcutta and took up seriously his life's work. And in 1850, Ram Mohan Roy uh, started Atyo Shabha, where Darakanath Tagore and uh, et al, they joined him. So, so uh, this uh, year, 2020, it is uh, uh, the uh, 200th uh, birth anniversary of Vishwa Chandra Vidyasagar, and we have probably have, have uh, uh, crossed 205 years after the uh, beginning of uh, Bengal Renaissance. So while talking about Bengal Renaissance, Again, Niti Shengupto, in his uh, History of Bengali-Speaking People, published in 2001, uh, uh, finds out that the Bengal Renaissance remained predominantly Hindu and only partially Muslim. Hindu school established in 1817, which played a crucial role in nourishing, nourishing the Bengali intellectual flourish, was also apparently set up as I quote, an institution for giving a liberal source, uh, liberal education to the children of the members of Hindu community. The divide and, policy, uh, divide and rule policy reached its first culmination point in 1905 with the first par partition of Bengal on the basis of religion that separated the largely mo Muslim East Bengal from the largely Hindu Western areas. The second partition of Bengal took place in 1947. Bengalis are probably the only race that suffered two partitions within a span of 50 years. So these partitions and dispersals, these two partitions have resulted in a large number of migrant refugee population throughout the last century. The homelessness and the rootlessness added new dimensions to the Bengali identity. And hence, the Bengali diaspora within and outside the Indian subcontinent ushered in the 
uh, could you please uh, someone was presenting yes thank you for stopping it uh, so so the homelessness and the rootlessness added new dimensions to the bengali identity and hence the bengali diaspora within and outside indian subcontinent ushered in the early traits of multiculturalism even before the globalization made multicultural traits quite common across the world and after globalization uh, uh, the stage who, in which we are now uh, probably the last two decades uh, are full, full of pluralities and multiplicities and these pluralities and multiplicities of bengali identity that have mainly emerged during the last two decades would require a debate um, around the contemporary agents that con construct such identities so as to offer ways of interrogating the process the processes of identity construction so this webinar will will focus uh, on the cultural social religious and political events that have impacted upon bengali identity during the last two centuries and uh, the webinar proposes to create a space for contestations and de deliberations on which on how uh, could you please uh, turn the mics off please uh, everyone uh, please turn your mics off and turn it on only when it is required everyone please so the webinar also proposes to create a space for contestations and deliberations on how such factors and facets related to bengali identity have been represented in different types of literary mediums we are going to see 30 paper presentations over 3 days and three distinguished resource persons uh, without uh, 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 speaking any more uh, May I now request uh, Dr. Shandip Kumar Boshak, Principal, South Centenary College, to deliver the welcome address. Dr. Boshak, please. Thank you, my colleague, Dr. Konar. On behalf of South Centenary College, a hearty welcome to you all in this Young Researchers International Webinar. The theme of this webinar is the evolution of Bengali identity. It is starting from today and will continue for the coming three days. It is being organized by Postscriptum, an international and interdisciplinary journal published by Department of English, Charles Centenary College. This webinar proposes to map the evolution of Bengali identity during the past 200 years. It is very relevant for this year. Distinguished resource persons will enrich this webinar. I hope the paper presentations by the young researchers in Dr. Boshak, we cannot hear you. Dr. Boshak, Dr. for organizing such webinar yes. i am not audible yes sir you are hello yes sir we can hear you now for a few seconds you were not audible but now I'm not audible you you are audible now we, we can hear you now you uh, you didn't hear anything no 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 for for uh, 10 shall 10 i repeat Yes, you can. Uh, Shall please, I repeat? Thank yes, thank you. Thank you. Please, please do. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear. I can hear you. Okay, okay. We, we can also hear you. Yes, it's Hello? perfect now. It's perfect now. Hello? I hope the yes. paper presentation by the young researchers, invited lectures, keynote addresses, each and every upcoming event, especially the interactive sessions of this webinar, will be a great success and add. A 
lastly, I would like to acknowledge the organizer for organizing such webinar on research in literature to motivate young researcher. I wish the academic event a great success. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Over to Pro Professor Kona. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can hear you. Yes, we can hear you now. Uh, there were little disturbances uh, uh, for 10, 12 seconds. We could not hear you, but it's all right. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much uh, uh, for uh, welcoming everyone on behalf of Short Centenary College. So we will now uh, begin the keynote speech. Uh, and uh, let me just check. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bhattacharya, are you here already? OK, I think I uh, we have to wait a little bit for Dr. Uh, uh, Nandini Bhattacharya. So uh, I'll just call her up and check uh, if she is. Yes, I just uh, talked to Dr. Bhattacharya. She will join uh, uh, within a few seconds. So uh, let me just begin. Uh, it is my privilege uh, to introduce uh, Professor Nondini Bhattacharya, uh, who is the uh, Professor of English in the Department of English and Cul Culture Studies, uh, the University of Bardwan. Uh, she is the project director of the SAP UGC DRS2 project entitled Ethics of Border Crossing, of the, uh, which is uh, conducted by the Department of English and Culture Studies at the University of Bardwan. Uh, she is uh, a, a visiting professor of National University of Juridical uh, Sciences, uh, where, he, uh, where she teaches a course on, on ethics, law, and literature. She is a recipient of UGC National Research Fellowship Award and Research Project Award of Maulana Abul Kalam Ajad Institute of Asian Studies, Kolkata. She is the curator of a permanent border crossing e event exhibition at the Department of English and Culture Studies at the University of Bardwan. Uh, there are many important books uh, authored and edited by uh, our keynote speakers. Some of them are R.K. Naran's The Guide, A Critical Companion, Molkraj Anand's uh, Untouchable, A Love Song to Our Mongrel Selves, a Problematic of Identity in the Novels of Salman Rushdie, Rabindranath Tagore's Gora, A Critical Companion, The Annotated Konkaboti, Translating a Modern Fairy Tale, among many other, her book on uh, her book on subcontinental epistolary narratives is being uh, published. I mean, going to be pu published soon by Orient Black Swan. Her current project is a monograph on accessories and plebiscites as part of subcontinental partitions. We are really glad to have him. We are really honored to have have her sorry uh, have her as our keynote speaker she she will uh, uh, speak on uh, being bengali reading bonkim chandra's bongo darshan and monica ali's brick lane as continuum this talk will explore questions of bengali identities perceptions of such being 
beleaguered and or as facing limitless opportunities it chooses two cultural texts from two times to examine these issues uh, dr bhattacharya please okay so uh, uh, can i be heard or should i yes. use the mic yes yes madam we can hear you and see you right right, right. um i i want to thank all the organizers for kindly having me and giving me this opportunity and it is a very important uh, area of exploration and i am not too sure as to how much time i am going to be given but whatever the time that is allotted to me or what i assume is allotted to me uh i will try and utilize so that i can at least broach this very complex idea you see and i see a lot of uh my friends and my mentors among the uh, among the audience so my regards to all of them and i begin my uh, lecture on identity with a, a simple uh, line that amidst myriad theories regarding identity all i will commit to is that identity is a claim and that of course it is mired in myriad counter claims but it is a claim and that bongo darshan is the first definitive claim for a heroic bengali identity this is what i would like to state now uh, i am not saying that bongo darshan is the first or bongo darshan was the last to claim a bengali identity but it was definitely a very important claim and therefore it requires its patra suchana or the first essay which is like a manifesto the prefatory essay i think requires a careful reading uh, for us to understand what is uh, what is a bengali identity what are we talking about now i would also say that uh, i am most intrigued by the a uh, name bongo darshan because uh, roughly translated it means a mirror or a window to bengal the bengalis and the bengali identity but it it could also mean and that is the way i would like to read it it I, it could also mean an idea that is an ideal of bengal i claim i I'm, uh, i'm i'm saying that bongo darshan is a claim and it is a claim for a heroic bengali identity and that the name itself is part of that claim no why one discusses a bengali identity today is i think fairly obvious because the bengali identity is has its back to the wall with a mounting and global islamophobia and the bengali being described as an outsider and terrorist in the rakhine in myanmar or during the process of ca as a bangladeshi infiltrator that like a termite was eating up the resources of the indian nation the bengali has been you know sort of uh, uh, well consequently seen as uh, as unheroic poor resourceless homeless radicalized cowardly from this position one can only go forward and in order to go forward i believe one has to look back to that time when the bengali identity is being forged and bengal is of course the bengal presidency is the capital of the british empire in the subcontinent and the bengali is english learned and the bengali has a fair amount of what you could call heroism amongst other uh, members other language groups of the subcontinent it is at at a fairly what i would say a, a good time that bongo darshan appears to claim a heroic identity but you know when bunkim is 
talking about the bengali he is simply i mean i you know it's 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 uh, unfortunate that the the talk about bengali identity must be done in english but i believe there are a lot of people who don't speak bengali so i am going to sort of you know paraphrase what uh, bunkim is saying and bunkim is saying that you know he is actually uh, is is calling out to a reader who is not there so he is creating what you could call an ideal reader now how does a reader help an identity cause you know i mean for an identity you could form a political party or stuff like that but i mean for bunkim it is the constitution of an ideal reader group that will cons- that will make the identity heroic now how does he do this he says that nobody who is kritobiddh who is knowledgeable all right and i translate this word kritobiddho as heroic somebody who has uh, well conquered vidya somebody who is vidyan somebody who is you know in control of his intellect and the world thereby this person will not read bengali he will not read bengali consequently he will not write in bengali and this is a vicious circle by which bengali will always remain the language of the woman in the you know the marriageable woman these are the three categories the normal school going son or child and uh, you know maybe the the person who is you know sitting in shops so these are not what you could call uh, heroic positions the woman who is going to get married the young boy who is going to a normal school incidentally this is something i've learned recently so i'm going to show off a little that the word normal school comes from france and uh, the first normal school was established in glasgow so uh, a normal school is is you know it it is an it is a it does have a new kind of teaching method but definitely these are not the kind of readers that bunkim believes will create any heroic identity so what creates a heroic identity that is that is the, what constitutes this claim to the heroic identity so there are three things the first is knowledge the second is knowledge and the third is knowledge all right so for bunkim the only way in which one can have a heroic identity is by being kritobiddho by having knowledge by creating knowledge by disseminating knowledge by reading knowledge all right so bangodarshan becomes that hub that knowledge hub where you write you read you create new genres and you invite in turn you create a virtuous circle by which the knowledgeable person comes to read bengali so this knowledge of course includes two things one is skill sets and the other is jothno all right these are the two words that bunkim is using that to be kritobiddho one has to be knowledgeable Uh, one has to be very very well read and especially imbibe the knowledge of the world and secondly one has to be skilled and one has to be very very porishtomi uh, and jotno shil one has to really work very hard at it i mean nobody is going to read something in a language in a modern vernacular just like that i mean when one has the option of sanskrit that is what he says when one has the option of english i mean why would someone read a text that is sort of uh, has no density jolo watery why would one read such a thing why would i mean this is a strange thing for a novelist to say i mean given that a novel is not considered to be a knowledge text you see a uh, story is not considered to be a knowledge text it's considered to be a creative text and remember bongo darshan is important because it begins with almost all the important modern indian genres if i may say so the first indian proper indian novel 
in an Indian language, uh, that is Bish Brikko, appears in Bongo Darshan. So do critical essays, so do satires, so, so do imaginative essays. Now, wh in what sense are these knowledge texts? Now, Bonkim, you know, even within all of this, he sort of pokes fun at Bidyashagur and says that the only people who are writing in Bengali are writing for children. Surely he's talking about Bidyashagur and he's talking about Bidyashagur who, uh, according to Bonkim, writes for children. So uh, that and uh, it is, he says, that Jolo Bhasha. So it's sort of, you know, the non-dense kind of language where knowledge seems to be very easily accessible, but to obfuscate, you know, not obfuscate in a pejorative sense, but to create those wrinkles, to create a density by which a reader is able to access in a creative way, a body of knowledge that is European that is Sanskritic and European, that is something Bonkim is saying, constitutes a serious heroic identity. People don't take you seriously if you don't write seriously. And if you don't have a literature and language of your own, which conveys that knowledge, then I believe that you are considered very, I mean, you are considered to be something like a fool. I mean, who is, what is an identity without a language? What is an identity without a literature? And what is that literature without knowledge? So the infusion of knowledge into Bengali is something that Bunkim is making a case for. Right, then the second thing that he's making a case for is Jotno. All right, a lot of care, you know, you edit and you re-edit and you create something that is dense, that one will, one can't just throw away. So Jotno and uh, of course with Jotno Puristram, but uh, a care, a lot of care, a lot of, you know, taking oneself seriously, not just writing any, any, anything. The other thing which I find to be incredible is the idea of Sharidayota. Isn't this an interesting idea, Sharidaya? Sharidaya means sympathetic. So he actually repeats the word Sharidaya, I think about six times within the Patra Suchana, which is a very slim essay, which is a kind of manifesto for, uh, for uh, the for uh, Bongo Darshan. It's the first essay of the first issue of Bongo Darshan. So important, Sharidai. So what he's discounting is the trickle down effect. He's saying that the British have spoken about education as a trickle down effect, all right? So you teach a few Kritobiddha people, a few knowledgeable people, lots of English, and maybe lots of Sanskrit. And then you hope that that knowledge is going to trickle down and make the rest of the ordinary, the, you know, the grocer, the girl who's going to get married, the boy who's going to normal school, they will somehow be educated by that, you know, that trickle down. But he says that that is not how things happen. And because we have depended on the trickle down, we have not been taken seriously. So the way forward, the way to be taken seriously is Sharidayota. Sharidayota is something I think all of us should take into account as a critical idea. Sharidai means to be one with. So when you are reading, you are reading a language, all right? So you are a Sharidai Pathok. But you are, so I am talking about reading as both a intellectual as well as a physiognomic process. You are reading with your body, you're reading with your mind, you're Sharidai. But what are you Sharidai to? You are Sharidai to the Bengali identity. You are Sharidai to the Bengali language. You are Sharidai to the idea of Bengal and Bengalis as a heroic group. Remember, I'm using the word heroic, you know, not in the sense of Achilles. I mean, who is, you know, 
Veer, Veer Tutis, but heroic in the sense of knowledgeable, heroic in the sense of somebody who's taken seriously. So Shoridayota will create that bond between the reader and the writer, and the reader will turn into the writer, and the writer will turn into the reader, and together they will create that virtuous cycle, that virtuous cycle in which more and more readers will be included. And as more and more knowledgeable readers are included, a heroic Bengali identity will be created. You see, this is something that Bong Kim actually believes. And interestingly enough, because, you know, I am a uh, student, I won't say a scholar, a student of literature, I would like to take out this identity question out of the field of social sciences into the field of genealogy or genre studies. You see, remember that Bong Kim is an intensely self-conscious writer and he knows that when he's creating this manifesto he's also talking about an essay you see basically the patra is an essay it's a it's a it's it's a, it's an essay like i mean essays of hazlitt or of bacon or you know the form of the essay which became so popular in the romantic period in the 18th century like uh, like Sherry, i'm sorry like uh, the essay is in Spectator or Tackler. So if it is an essay, he's saying that this essay is an enabler. All right. So he is not talking of identity, especially in the sense that a social scientist would be speaking. Though, I mean, the implications of such are there. I mean, the Bengali who becomes heroic and respectable is, of course, a socio-political uh, commodity. And of course, that socio-political commodity has economic ramifications. But as a writer of literature, he says that, you see, he takes on a very romantic Darwinian stance. He says that this is an essay. This essay is an enabler. All right. By reading this essay, you become the Sharidai Pathok. You become a subscriber to and this essay has an organic life. Now, this was a very common idea in the 18th century. And especially there was a French genealogist, a genre studies person, who was also a biologist whose name is uh, Ferdinand Brunetier, who said that all genres have a beginning, a growth period, and then a death. All right, so he's saying that this essay is like, and Bongo Darshan, which it sort of represents, is like an enabler, but it has a, it is beginning now, it will enable a heroic identity. And then, of course, Bongo Darshan will go down because, uh, I mean, Bongo Darshan can't be there for all times. And I don't claim that Bongo Darshan will be there forever. But this enabling moment, you know, this booster dose, as it were, this enabling moment is when the enabler is at its height. And so the essay is a form which will enable a heroic identity simply by its own writing. So it's a convoluted logic by which the essay is commending itself and its writing and also talking talking about its ability by the very good Bengali that it pronounces, by its arguments, a heroic Bengali identity. So I think this is a, you know, a fantastic, this is a great beginning, a great push, as it were, where there is a literary uh, form that is being born, that is the essay, the critical essay. And it is a literary form that is talking about how the Bengali language, literature, and the Bengali identity may be formed. And it is also talking about ways of creating it. One of the ways of creating it is by reading, being Sharidai, to you know, be with the Bengali. And to be with the Bengali is a very social idea. You know, it's not like, I mean, all Bengalis are going to read Bongo Darshan together. But by reading Bongo Darshan together, you become aware of the, the classes. He's actually talking about the French Revolution, 
which was caused by the uh, the borno bhed and i'm sorry the 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 borgo bhed the uh, because somebody was high and somebody was low so by reading bongo darshan together the low and the high bengali will come together within a reading writing space which in turn will create a luminosity and create a heroic identity that is bonkim's position and i think very very interesting very very interesting because bongo darshan is being intertextually used by tagore this very form of the critical essay is being laughed at by uh, by rovindranath in nashtonir because amol is trying to write critical essays like the uh, essays of the bongo darshan school and his derivative and is being poked fun at and of course there is uh, charu who is more imaginative so rovindranath uh, in a way is both paying his obeisance and he's also clearing space he's saying that there could be another way of writing while paying obeisance to bongo darshan in kabuli wala i am only giving the very simple examples there are so many uh, in kabuli wala there is a bhadralok bengali father who is stuck in writing the bonkim kind of novel because he doesn't know where his uh, hero is going to escape with the heroine they are stuck in a, in a balcony kind of a place so rovindranath is aware and rovindranath was an editor of bongo darshan the valence the charge of bongo darshan in the creation of a heroic identity so bongo darshan for me remains that you know touchstone where the bengali identity is made in relation to english because english is the language of knowledge and in relation to other modern vernaculars which bonkim actually speaks about he speaks about tamil telugu toilungi he says toilungi these are languages which are also growing but you know in a sort of ethno heroic manner ethno uh, you know nationalist manner bonkim says that bangla will somehow be more important bangla will be the language of knowledge so with these words i will uh, i will state that uh, there are two more uh, moments in history of bengal where uh, the uh, where these uh, you know these peak points happen or one of course would be the uh, the creation of bangladesh that would be a peak point because it is a country that is being a nation state that is being formed on the basis of language the other peak point would be the partition by which bengal is mutilated and mutilated in a, in a very complicated way very very complicated way the reverberations of which we are we see in the creation of bangladesh all right the i've been working on the uh, on the on the plebiscites and uh, the plebiscite of uh, the referendum of silet by which a portion of bengal presidency which went to assam goes again to bangladesh you know so the questions of ethnicity the questions of language the questions of community affiliation all these again come together in that moment of partition so that is the other moment when i would say the bengali language is being questioned the bengali identity is being questioned and i believe that shorit is going to speak about this in a later uh, uh, lecture the third point would be of course the uh, the making of bangladesh the making of bangladesh creates uh, you know several uh, strengths and uh, weaknesses for bengalis for one thing the bengali in india is uh, you know now uh, and increasingly being called or being conflated with the bangladeshi so is the bengali in india something different from the bengali in bangladesh as i have said in my opening remarks that in the rakhine valley the the 
question of Bengali ethnicity merges with the with the uh, larger Islamophobia, and there is a pushback. There is a continuous pushback into. Bangladesh into India as a result of a critical Bengali identity. You know, I use the word critical because the Bengali identity is seen as something that is unfitted, that is that sort of spills over, that sort of can't be included within one uh, territory or one nation state in a uh, in a in a in a in in a sort of heroic way. I mean, if you say that, uh, for example, Britain, uh, British identity has spilled over into USA, North America, th that is a heroic spilling over, okay? Because the Anglo-American identity seems to sort of straddle across the world as a, a uh, Anglophone identity. And there is no sense of back to the wall for such an identity position. So uh, uh, what I'm saying is when I talk about a critical Bengali identity position, I'm saying that this spilling over might happen to other language groups and other ethnicities. But for Bengal, it is a moment of crisis. Now, I have chosen another text that is Monica Ali's Brick Lane, which was published in 2003. And uh, uh, very, it's fetid, made into a movie, not a very nice movie, but part of a, uh, you know, again, part of a very critical time in Britain with regards to the Bengali identity. Number one, then in the 80s and 90s, there are these spikes of race riots. Now, these are uh, directed at uh, the you know the non-whites, but because the Bethnal Green area, the Allgate area in which Brick Lane is situated, this is very Bangladeshi dominated. Therefore, the Bengali is again seen as poor, as an immigrant, as somebody who's eating up the resources of the English nation. Now, uh, this is uh, another. Point when uh, when Bengali becomes uh, becomes you know also a matter of assertion. So there is a revival of say Kaji Nojrul. There is a, a revival of Lalon Shai and a specific kind of Bengali identity based on communitarian lines or or you know drawing communitarian lines, those are asserted in the Bethnal Green area. In fact, if you go there now, you will see that there is a community center which is named after Kaji Nojru. It's called the Nojrul Community Center. And Lalum Shai is also given a great position of importance. So this uh, giving importance to writers who are seen with a more specific Islamic identity, I think is uh, the way that the Bengali identity seems to be moving. However, in uh, in, in uh, Brick Lane, uh, Brick Lane is interesting because Brick Lane is in English. All right. So after so many years, 17, I'm sorry, 1872, I think Bongo Darshan was published. Uh, in 2003, we are still writing in English. and uh, But the English that 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 uh, uh, that uh, Monica Ali is using is a strangely Bangladeshi kind. You know, you can actually see the bones of Dhakaya Bangal in it, and uh, it it uses a very Bengali folklore trope, and that is. Uh, now, this happens to be the beginning of a chhara of Dokhinaranjan Mitra Mojumdar. Now, Dokhinaranjan Mitra Mojumdar came from the Ulaul, Ulaul uh, village in near Maimon Singh Dhaka. So, this is something that forms the basis of that novel. Now, what happens? What is this Shatshamudra Taranodhi part? In fact, we have a number of sociologists who have uh, Caroline Adams, for example, then Naila Kabir, for example, who have used this phrase without actually, uh, you know, uh, they have referred it to some Sileti Sasis, 
who have said we have come from satsumudra taro nodir pa sasi is a bangladeshi way of saying chachi but they have not referred to the 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 bengali uh, folklorist uh, that is dokhinaranjan mitra mujumdar neither have they referred to guru sadar datto who was actually from silet now brick lane is a silet story all right now what is this silet britain connection the silet britain connection as many of you all who have looked at naila kabir's work on bangladeshi garment workers you might be knowing that the transactions between silet and britain you know preceded uh, a lot of things in fact the east india company used sileti uh, seamen to work in their uh, in their ships especially in the uh, where you know you would feed coal to the engine so very tough work and very few people and they would mostly also get killed first because they were in the uh, coal of the jahaz they they you know the body of the ship so these people were enormously hard working silet is still known as very good for making ships and uh, boats that is a local skill and these men went to mostly they went to this place which is in and around olgate bethnal green this is a place where they settled and then they brought in their wives most of them were uneducated at least uneducated in english and they had a very hard time uh, with race uh, feelings prejudices and also the separation from their homeland this is the background that you will have to understand however by the end of the 20th century there is a dramatic change with the coming of bangladesh there is a dramatic change in the nature of transactions and the women of silet the women of dhaka the women in uh, the bethnal greens are now involved in a uh, in what is known as a garment trade so garment trade becomes that skein c s k e i n skein which actually joins these two and bengali again emerges as a language which is to be used in this economic transaction so that is the story of bricklane bricklane is a story of two sisters nazneen and hasina one in dhaka and later to many other places and the other in bricklane and both of them ultimately in the garment industry and both of them trying to find their ways out in a very bengali way in britain and in bangladesh this finding their way out is another try at reviving a heroic bengali identity i mean uh, where there is a woman who is uh, severely raped she is severely taken advantage of that is the case of hasina in bangladesh because the garment workers the women garment workers are considered to be easy target for the mullahs so but it does give hasina some money some agency and some amount of heroism similarly in britain there is nazneen who is herself in a hijab but she is uh, tying uh, you know she's stitching on little uh, uh, you know but the 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 zips of 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 uh, Uh, jeans and the hems of short skirts so she is making some money whereas her husband who has a degree in english literature from dhaka university can't do anything because he is considered to be uh, you know his english is not english enough so you see it is the bengaliness of nazneen and her ability to sew that saves the family and gives the family uh, a choice you know the uh, one of the lines that naila kabir uses and uh, bricklane uses is the power to choose the garment workers now have a power to choose the heroic identity that one is talking about is the heroic identity of the bangladeshi woman who is able to now speak her language 
speak broken english and but let her bengali uh, bones and muscles show through that english and you know emerge within a transnational situation where bengali again becomes a heroic position and the whole question of the rajkonne who is able to uh, you know overcome everybody when the rajputras have been turned into stone and uh, who crosses shat samudra taranodir par to become the savior is a trope that is repeated in bricklain which is why i say that for me bricklain is a Uh, is is a is a uh, novel that is enormously interesting because it pulls the skins from the 19th century early 20th century folklorists uses the trope of someone who can change things who can who's a game changer and who can create that miracle of an economic turnaround an economic transformation who can adjust in a global city who can make bengali alive again and let me give you this information that brick lane is now called bangla town and most of the signage over there is in bengali thank you thank you so much uh, dr bhattacharya uh, so we now uh, ha are going to uh, uh, receive questions and discuss them uh, dr bhattacharya is uh, here so uh, i have a few questions myself as well uh, but uh, first i would like to invite uh, the audience if they have any questions observations uh, something that they wish to discuss with dr bhattacharya please you can post your comments in the chat box on this online platform or you can unmute yourself and uh, ask your question so if there uh, actually uh, madam uh, mm. when i was listening to your lecture during uh, 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 towards the beginning of your lecture you were talking about uh, talking about uh, this uh, a few qualities that are required uh, that were mentioned by bongim chandra chatobadhyay uh, and uh, and there uh, bongim chandra chatobadhyay also mentioned the role of language and no knowledge and care or jotno and porishram all these things do you think bongin chandra was basically a methodist bongin chandra was basically a methodist uh, uh, in the european sense of the term mm, i don't know uh, what you mean by a methodist i mean what exactly are you trying to say uh methodist in the sense that, that there is a, a difference between classicism and populism uh, mm. uh for popularism so so when bonkim chandra is more uh, 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 dependent on uh, the classical uh, procedure of uh, uh, practices and exercises where he mm. he considers knowledge care and and the this jotno and porishram and all these elements uh, uh, for for a successful uh, production of literary work or anything do you think in that sense uh, he is trying to be a more classical or uh, in the european sense of the term you see he is uh, he is very stung by the fact that Uh, bengalis are not taken seriously the bengali language is not taken seriously and what has already appeared in bengali is mostly textbooks by bidyashagor mm. so when he talks of a heroic identity of course heroism does involve even if it is physical heroism it does involve jotno and porishram i'm sure achilles would have his physical uh, you know exercises every day and uh, strength building exercises every day but one seems to believe that 
creating. Yes, I agree with you that creativity is an instinctive process. That is not what Bunkin Chandra believes. Bunkin Chandra believes that creativity is a process which requires tremendous amount of attention to details. And therefore, even though the end result may be magical, it, it requires many things. Plus, it requires the knowledge of who is going to read your yes. writing. You see, that, I think, is a very new thing. I mean, the classical writers would assume a readership. But to, ash to create a readership when there wasn't any, there isn't a Bengali reader. A Bengali reader is being created into being. And that reader is the one who is going to create that heroic identity. I think mm -hmm. this is a very, very, you know, cutting edge idea. This is a very new idea. Remember that the book is being born in Bengal. Mm -hmm. Printing technologies are being, uh, you know, evolved. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bongo Darshan is, is a fairly high priced journal. Given that 10 rupees was one of the you know, normal salary. Uh, uh, Bongo Darshan used to cost three rupees. So despite this, he has the slagha, the pride, you know, that it is going to be read by the commonest of persons. So yes, I guess it is both romantic and classical in, <laughs> its, in its hope. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, madam. And uh, here, Navonita Pal is asking, Madam, could you please comment on the migrant Sileti Bengali community in the Northeast India with reference to heroic Bengali identity? Uh, no, I, I yes, Nabunita, thank you for your question. But I believe that the uh, heroic Bengali identity as articulated in the Northeast is something that Dipendu is going to talk about. Professor Dash is going to talk about. And therefore, uh, I will not, uh, you know, tread where uh, angels are treading with, with trepidation. But uh, the northeastern problem of Bengali identity, this is the only little thing that I would like to say, is the result of the numerous partitions of the Bengal presidency, the numerous realignments that went on during the colonial period in order to right size a territory. You see, one of the reasons why territories are partitioned or there's a demand for a new state is according to political scientists, the, the desire for right size. You see, we are similar people and we are going to live together in a right size territory. Okay, mm -hmm. so this right sizing is actually a wrong idea. I mean, there is no right size for right people. There will always be spillages, but partitions and accessions and divisions continuously take place because we desire a kind of conformity and right size. Now, this right sizing of territories in the colonial period, including the British, uh, you know, the actual promise given to the Rakhine people that they would have a separate homeland, just like Pakistan. This is a less known story, which has created the present problem of Rohingyas. While the, you know, the Japanese had promised that if they won, then the entire territory would belong to people of the uh, Mongolian identities. So mm -hmm. the, the, the Mon, the Chin, those kind of identities. Now the ethnic war that is being fought in Myanmar and the pushback of the Myanmaris is the result of this right-sizing promises. I mean, this didn't happen. So Northeast is another question. The yeah. question of Northeastern identity will be discussed by Professor yeah. Dash. I'm sure far better than I know. Uh, here, uh, Madam, uh, Onesha Bhattacharya is asking, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, you spoke of the Bengalis of Rakhine province, mm -hmm. who, in, in my experience, are not often looked at in the study of Bengali identity and literature. Do you agree with this assessment? If so, what do you believe is the reason for this neglect? 
how can this be remedied see one of the reasons why it is not included is because the bengali identity we speak about is very calcutta centric and yes. it is also to a large extent very hindu centric yes. therefore uh, and all there are many people who are not well read in history therefore the question of rakhine bengalis uh, and of many bengali expatriates who worked in then burma and were forced to leave because of their supposed bengali identity that is something that requires some study those languages need to be uh, included within what is known as promito bangal ba bangla promito bangla must be surrounded by a constellation of other banglas if one is looking at the northeast then one is already seeing mia kovita one is already seeing sadri bhasha one is already seeing the languages of the minor groups i use the word minor within quotations to uh, you know interacting with the bengali language and uh, of course i i have to admit that by the time vidyashagar was done with the bengali language it had already and this was post mutiny so there was another phase of islamophobia so a lot of parso arabic had been sort of marginalized and uh, bonkim continued that process so the bangla that we have is highly sanskritized and highly anglicized so those are the two pillars on which promito bangla stands now in bangladesh i believe there is a greater attempt to look at bangla in a more uh, in a, the bengali identity as more you know copious as more inclusive as including the bangla that the bengali speak in england what about that bangla the sileti bangla in brickling the english that is spoken in liazo with bangla you see that so we must sort of you know extend mm. our borders and boundaries in to include a heroic bengal but bonkim's first and last proposition that it should be infused with knowledge that is i think still stands true uh Mohammad uh, Nahid Kamal here. He uh, he asks, Madam, you said Lalon and Kaji Nojrul Islam as Islamic writers, while they were recognized as secular. Why is that? See, the again, I have said right in the beginning that an identity is a claim. okay and it the might be mired in numerous counter claims kaji nojrul is a bengali writer but if you claim kaji nojrul as the inceptor of a bangladeshi bengali identity then you that is a claim that you are making in brick lane the community center that is called uh, the nojrul community center which is is so it, it uh, nojrul is claimed just as some of the peers are claimed this they are claimed not only because they are of islamic identity but because they are bengali and it is that part of bengal which is accessible to these people okay so uh, what is accessible to me is bengali for me if bonkim is accessible to me that is bengali for me if nojrul is accessible to someone it's bengali for that there is no Uh -huh. i mean i'm not saying that one is secular and the other is not they are both bengali writers talking about a bengali identity uh stella bishwas here uh, she asks madam uh, when you talk about the idea of the reader as a hero do you mm -hmm. see it as a major ideological force behind the reconfiguration of child rearing practices and juvenile literature in colonial bengal i i don't really know this you know i mean of course reading is very important to the pedagogic process reading is very important uh, and in fact the, after the primer it is called a reader 
all right most of the uh, basic books they are either called primers as they have alphabets and numericals and then they are called readers because they teach you how to read so reading yes i agree is the basic cognitive process and therefore any kind of rearing any kind of child or adult rearing will require reading but what bonkim is speaking about is a more political kind of reading mm -hmm. it is a more active interpretative community an exactly. adult interpretative community adult in the sense of you know being more participative mm -hmm. in the community that i am speaking about i am not really speaking about reading practices as part of child rearing practices because that is something bonkim is already trashing he's saying that the only kind of writing you have in bengali is books for children primers and readers so mm. that is not the kind of reader he's looking at thank you so much uh, madam here uh, dr uh, shorbani banerji she wants to uh, uh, unmute herself and uh, ask you something yes i'm ready thank you nandini ji for a fantastic presentation as usual it is a joy to listen to you and thank you it it did open a lot of windows in my mind as well we have so many ignorant pockets there now i wanted to ask you i found it so interesting and i wanted to ask you a kind of a regressive question that is um, when we read as bengalis at least our generation we did read our bonkim chandros and sharad chandros now when we read bonkim chandro we find that as he is you know as a, uh, a, a as a sort of an offshoot of ram mohan roy and vidyasagar's movement and his own as you so wonderfully projected and how he presented in bongo darshan you we will find that his female characters in his uh, novels are have a mind and an identity of their own true but but in the next phase when sharad chandra is writing and mm. because his language was much more easier as compared to the sanskritized bonkim chandra mm. uh, he was more popular among the reading audience mm. i found that his women took mm. that yatno and porishram rather too seriously and mm. so they, they presented a self sacrificing mm. uh, you know and and ephemeral being of perfection which yes. was you know conforming to the patriarchal society's expectations so, yes uh, and because he was so popular do you think mm. that the good work of bonkim chandra was undone in a regressive kind of manner by sharad chandra's female uh, protagonist no i think uh, bonkim chandra was also very patriarchal <laughs> most of his <laughs> most, most of his deviant females either yeah, had yeah. poison as in uh, bishbrikko bishbrikko yeah. is very literal because somebody actually takes poison and pundonondini yeah. uh, <laughs> and uh, m many of them are shot dead so <laughs> I, I, yes so but in sharad chandra i think the patriarchal ideas are more naturalized they have become more invisible in the sense that they are now seen as devotion they are now yes. seen as a kind of you know seamless piety the uh, komolmoni i think in the end she declares sikanto to be the god all right mm -hmm. so the man has now become a god and uh, this is also true for rovindranath for that matter look at something like ghare baire where you know there is a punishment for the for bimala yes uh, for yes. her uh, transgressions even though the trans you see i think this uh, this uh, you know this ambivalence is a very creative ambivalence it's not a either or bonkim's women are you have rightly guessed they are very very transgressive kapal kundala ekundo nandini indira indira they are very transgressive and this is the beginning of a generic form the the novel yeah. but uh, you see the bengali woman sort of gets a little normalized and her devotion becomes love and love becomes devotion so uh, sharad chandra definitely he is able to invisibilize the raw passions is able to disperse them so yes right 
but bonkim is as patriarchal as you could get in <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so much thank you so much and uh, dr antara mukherjee wants to ask something uh, antara if you could un unmute yourself yes uh, thank you madam uh, that was a fascinating lecture and please pardon my ignorance when i asked this i was just wondering on that question of sympathy that you were mm -hmm. talking about and uh, i i was wondering whether uh, the bhadralok culture that is there in bangladeshon has mm -hmm. ever thought of including the itor culture of the time uh, mm. if not if not then was he really sympathetic or was he really uh, you know preaching and practicing the same thing yes this is a difficult question antara you see the, he is you know as a reader he definitely wants the itor look he wants them to be part of that active interpretative community there is no two things about it and and you know reading itself is a democratizing process now whether he actually mixed with the torjon whether his texts percolated into the absolutely low and you know the hapless that is a matter of conjecture but he was very well read he was very well read remember that there is a reference in uh, Uh, Neil Dorpon, where one mm. says that Chol Betal Puri. So mm. you see, but he was well. I mean, uh, I, 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 there, there is an element of. I mean, the, so many instances where his novels are being referred to. So it's not like even if people didn't actually buy them or read them, they didn't know. Rovindranath himself would read out portions of Bangu Darshan to his family members. so uh, this again you know one can only conjecture but as a matter of uh, a policy as a matter of something that he is wanting as a principle he feels that there the itor and the upper classes could only come together by reading together mm -hmm. by creating that active interpretative community hence sharidayata as an active principle of Bengali identity making, okay. just as Shat Shomudra Taranodir Par and Shon Dhula Mutha Shona Mutha Kora is that active principle of Bengali identity making in the garment workers. All right, yes. so you must yes. you need a trope, you need an imaginative trope. Right. So these right. are the two tropes that I have looked at. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much. Thank you, so thank you so Am much. Thank you so much, madam. Yes. And yes. thank yes. you, thank but, you for but, such a such a beautiful. But, uh, yes. Thank you so much, and and uh, we do not have enough words to express our gratitude, but we still will try. Uh, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Sri Shammo Srimani, a uh, faculty in the Department of English, uh, South Centenary College. he will deliver the uh, vote of thanks uh, at the end of this inaugural session but he is uh, a, an mphil student at jadavpur university and he will start with a question towards you madam <laughs> okay but shammo if you could start you can uh, ask your question and then you move on to uh, the vote of thanks uh -huh. thank you sir am i audible yes yes oh thank thank you very much sir uh, very one a uh, very good evening to you ma'am i have a simple question my question is uh would it be right to say that a newer kind of readership is inherently created with every new kind of writing uh is it possible to attain a solution to this struggle as to who comes first the reader mm. or the writer mm. that's, that's, a, that's a tough one that's a tough one yes it is it is a chicken and egg question hey, but, yes but come uh, is it your name is shammo yes ma'am yes ma'am yes shammo the prop, there are certain You know, actually, Shambha, you need to cut the noise from 
Shamu, uh, uh, please, please cut the noise, please. Yeah, yes, thank you. Shamu, there is the other question, the question of actual buying and selling of a, of a periodical in a highly competitive world of print. So whether the reader comes first or the writing comes first becomes an easy question to answer when you are uh, you know, trying to sell a periodical. And when you're trying to sell a periodical, the reader does come uh, you know, along with the writer, because unless you have created a sufficiently wide readership base, and unless you have floated an idea of the reader, you know, just like one floats a tender of a of a of a product. Okay, so one floats an idea, one, and that is an inflated idea. So unless that is done, the product won't sell. So I believe that they not only go together, but the creation of an interpretative, active interpretative community who can bring in political changes is a very, very important idea at that particular moment. Thank you, yes. ma'am. Yes. Thank you very much. Shammo uh, will now uh, deliver the vote of thanks uh, at the end of this inaugural session. Shammo, please. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for a very wonderful lecture, ma'am. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was an enriching experience for all of us. Uh, it was like insight, full of insight and information. Uh, on behalf of everybody at South Anthony College and Postscriptum Journal. I hereby thank you. I extend my earnest gratitude to take for taking out your most precious time, and thank you for that wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, and. Uh, here we now begin the business session one, uh, where uh, Dr. Sharbani Banerjee, Associate Professor of English at Triveni Devi Bhalotia College, and also uh, one of the senior members uh, in the Editorial Advisory Board of uh, Postscriptum, uh, will chair this session. And the paper presenters in this session are Shormita Rai and Mita Bondobadhai and Devottama Ghosh and Nivedita Paul. We have four paper presenters here. And may I now re request Dr. Banerjee to proceed with our business session one. Dr. Banerjee, please. Thank you so much, uh, Ramanuj. It is always a pleasure to work with you and to work with Postscriptum. With whom, thanks to you, I have been associated for quite a long time. and. Uh, Without any ado, let us start with this. We are all looking forward to four really exciting sessions. May I first of all uh, call upon, um, this is uh, Shormita Rai. She's a senior doctoral research fellow of Delhi University. Her topic today is the elusive science, medicine and women in late colonial Bengal. This is a wonderful, and I'm sure it's going to be a very uh, interesting and exciting paper. May I now please request Shormita Rai to start with her paper presentation. I think we have about 15 minutes time, uh, after which we can take questions. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, yes. Right. Thank you for this opportunity to allow for allowing me to address this wonderful session. Um, the paper that I'm reading today is called The Elusive Science, Medicine and Women in Colonial Bengal. 
in this paper i uh, aim to analyze the unique impact of educating women in the sciences especially medicine and reflect on the development of a characteristically scientific temperament among bengali women so that is basically the perspective from where i'm approaching uh, the time period of my study is starting from 19th century so it is obviously very important to understand like uh, in our inaugural lecture also we have been looking at the same time period and this was the time which is characterized by various kinds of social reform movements and in the context of these series of social reforms we see a variety of issues pertaining to women that are being addressed one of the major issues that is being addressed is with respect to uh creating opportunities of formally educating women and promoting formal education among females and this promotion of formal education led to unprecedented and unintended kind of advancements in the status as well as opportunities that were created for women i am looking at a particular uh, point or a particular aspect in this context wherein i am trying to understand how the curriculum of women were finally expanded enough so that women also had the opportunity to step into the field of the sciences uh it has been like uh, this kind of attitude has been reflected in various writings that science was considered to be masculine not only in terms of its practitioners but also in terms of its ethos and substance and this essence was reflected not only in the context of india but this was the general notion that was prevalent across the world and therefore before i come to the context of bengal i'd like to draw a kind of a parallel development that was going on in the west since my focus is on medicine i am going to talk about the first woman who is becoming the doctor in the context of the world and this person is elizabeth blackwell in 1849 she is gaining her graduation in uh, medicine from the geneva Med medical college of new york and she is the first who is coming from the us in the context of the europe in the in uk we have elizabeth garrett anderson uh, blackwell anderson and there are these two other students sophia jex blake and edith peachy they become the forerunners of leading a movement which is leading to the establishment of the london school of medicine for women London School of Medicine for Women is established in 1874 and this is happening with a lot of struggle on their part one of the very it is very interesting to note that one of the arguments that the women are presenting particularly we have sophia jex blake who is presenting this argument that even if it is not for the purpose of the west but no one can deny that women in india are in dire need extreme need for medical attention and this medical attention can be provided to them only by women because of certain kinds of restrictions pertaining to parda and other kind of restrictions that are uh, present in the context of india and this argument is taken forward and is taken up even while reformers in the context of bengal are trying to incorporate include women in the context of bengal as well so while we have the establishment of london school of medicine for women in 1874 around the same time we have reformers in the context of bengal who are trying to get their daughters granddaughters admitted into the calcutta medical college initial efforts are failing and after the failure of certain initial efforts we have the first woman who is entering into the calcutta medical college kadambini bos who is later becoming kadambini ganguly we have a more detailed paper coming up right after this so i'll not get into the details of that but it is important that 1884 was the first time that we have a woman in the context of bengal joining the medical uh, institution to become professionally trained trained in medicine it is realized that the calcutta medical college may not cater to all the women who might be interested in taking up the medical profession and therefore we have the uh, the campbell medical school also opening its door or granting permission to women to join a medicine and here we have a woman called hoimavati sen hoimavati sen is actually uh, one of the earliest graduates from the campbell medical school and she has actually written an autobiography which is very fascinating translated and edited by geraldine forbes and topun uh, raichaudhri 
so she is becoming the next significant woman who is uh, an, another significant woman who is joining the medical profession apart from that another woman i want to talk about is jamini shain jamini shain was also among the earliest of bengali women who is joining the calcutta medical college and jamini shain left behind very extensive diary details and diary accounts which were later compiled together and published by her sister tamini roy who is a, a very well known poet in the context of bengali the works or the writings that we have biographical writings autobiographical memoirs that we have that are coming from these women are very interesting because they are talking about how these women are making inroads for bengali women in the field of sciences we see that in the like while these women did not have a very strong kind of scientific background in terms of their education Hoymaboti Sen, Shen, for instance, she barely had some preliminary education. But once they are doing this entire course on medicine, they are required to uh, study subjects as varied and as specialized as surgical anatomy, uh, anatomy, chemistry, zoology, medical jurisprudence, surgery, and midwifery, among others. So it is very evident of the kind of um, kind of difficulty level that they had to face in terms of gaining their training in the context of medicine hoymaboti shen in her uh, uh, in her memoirs in her autobiography she is writing that it is not only the studying part that was difficult but also to gather that same amount of time and resources the money to procure books and also to understand the way in which things are being taught in the classroom the lack of knowledge of english all of these became a sort of impediment for the female students to understand at this point in time in spite of all of this they are overcoming all of these barriers becoming very successful and leading careers which are spanning over decades and these women including kadumbini ganguly and jamini shen are not only serving in the context of india but they are also serving in the context across the world wherein especially in the context of nepal where they have long years of service what they are giving geraldine forbes is saying is a kind of a hybrid medicine wherein they are combining certain indian knowledge systems that are emerging from indigenous medical systems and combining this with their knowledge of western medicine and that is what is making them acceptable within indian and bengali homes as such the next aspect of my paper is looking at the different kind of journal productions which is also telling us about the emergence of a temperament among the bengali women in terms of the kind of sciences that they are looking for there are these various journals that we have including medical journals like shastho shastho samachar chikitsa sammiloni and we have other women's journals including bamabodhini patrika bharati and antopur in all of these there are women who are writing and women who are being addressed through these journals and they are being given advice on a whole range of aspects of their lives including how to run their households how to lead their individual lives on motherhood child care nutrition precautions to be taken during pregnancy and childbirth and all of these are in a way trying to inspire them and instill in them a kind of a scientific temperament a kind of a inclination towards uh, becoming more scientific in their approach in their daily lives so in this kind of a way what we see is that there is a lot of interaction that is taking place between the knowledge knowledge systems of indigenous medicine and the knowledge systems and practices of western medicine which is leading to a very different kind of an identity formation among the women in bengal the minds of bengali women are being shaped and groomed towards adopting a more scientific and empirical approach and developing a scientific temperament by appealing to their faculties of reasoning and teaching them various principles of health hygiene and systematic scientific ways of living over the late 19th and the early 20th century a uh, women in bengal accomplished an extraordinary feat some became qualified professional doctors while the larger uh, part of the society became receptive to scientific ideas together they challenged they transformed they reinvented discourses around medicine health 
hygiene as well as education and gender relations there was a perceivable interplay between science and the indian or the bengali sensibilities that charted innovative paths of progress for the bengali society so i have kept my presentation short to actually stick to the time limit if uh, there are any so much any that was really very thank you for the time limit because time is at a short and uh, thank you for a really concise yes, a very wonderful presentation i congratulate you on your you know research thank faculty you. and the way that you have perceived this and um, if if anybody has any questions they may uh, type it out in the message box very quickly okay it seems that we have lost connection uh, with uh, dr uh, sharbani banerji so uh, i'm waiting for the question see if there is any or we can move on to the next paper without wasting any time uh, may i now request uh, meeta bondopadhyay meeta bondopadhyay uh, is is a senior doctor re, doctoral research fellow at the national uh, institute of technology department of humanities and social sciences durgapur she will be speaking on female literacy in bengal the journey of a woman from andormohol to a professional life meeta bondopadhyay if you are here uh, you can please unmute yourself and start presenting Uh, our chair has lost connection i believe so when she comes back she will moderate the interactions hello am i audible sir yes you are uh thank you sir a very good evening to all the audience present in the webinar i would like to thank postscript for organizing such a web seminar for the research fellow thanks again uh well we all have heard our first participant focus on the evolution of the role of women with special reference to kadambini ganguly himbati sen and jamini sen as qualified doctors of western medicine a profession that had been initially dominated by the male section of the society for a considerable number of decades restricting women primarily to the role of midwives the focus of this paper is to step back a few steps and look at the women's education system prevailing during the 19th century in bengal a period generally termed as the bengal renaissance and the journey of kadambini basu to dr kadambini ganguly the journey undertaken by kadambini to become the first female medical student of calcutta medical college was fraught with innumerable hurdles mainly brought upon her by a section of the society comprising of the urban educated male for whom the only role that could have been assumed by the woman was that of shahodhormini one who was supposed to uh, understand the ideas and beliefs of her husband and carry on a devoted service of a wife and mother while this was the scenario prevailing within the society there were some eminent male stalwarts who constantly assisted the female in getting rid of her clutches so as to come out uh, to the forefront of public life though there had been the support of a handful of male reformists who helped women to emerge from the darkness of domesticated life into the public it was mainly tarukanath ganguly kadambini's husband uh, whose contribution and uninterrupted zeal and reformative spirit ushered winds of change in the field of female literacy and empowered them to find the exit from ondar mohal to a life of freedom and liberty and with him accompanying in this crusade of female education and emancipation was kadambini basu later dr kadambini ganguly who was also the flag bearer of the entire reformative act now i would like to uh, present uh, change the screen and present a powerpoint uh, presentation uh, so i'm changing the screen sir
uh, your uh, mobile screen is visible. Yeah, open uh, the presentation slide. Is it, uh, uh, are the slides visible, madam? Only uh, they are coming in uh, together. They should be coming separately, no? To enlarge it a little bit. Yeah, if they are coming. But in uh, uh, okay, uh, let me uh, read the you know first. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Renaissance in Bengal, which started. Uh, which started with the setup of college, uh, the Hindu college and the national library, the coming in of the Western ideas into the Indian education system. But if we look at uh, the education and uh, the Western ideas coming into the uh, India, means the Bengal province, it was mainly the male who got the advantage of this Western liberal education. Um, the women were not at all the the women never got later got the advantage, uh, but initially they did not. So uh, my second slide shows the condition of women during the 19th century. Uh, during the 19th century, the society in Bengal was mainly infested with practices like sati, child marriage, polygamy. Uh, it was uh, the initiation by Raja Ramohan Roy. Uh, that the sati system uh, stopped uh, stopped in bengal at around uh, 1829 and it was under his reformative zeal that uh, and not only his but uh, along with the issue of the bidar shagor that the female education started in bengal but uh, even if we look at the education system, the education, well, though it was a formal school education that had started in Bengal, it was of the very basic preliminary sort of education because uh, women at that time were basically trained to, uh, to be, uh, you know, the Shahud Hormini, one who could support the ideas and beliefs of the male, the newly educated urban male, uh, they required a wife who would understand their viewpoints and for that women were uh, treated, educated in that form. So women education never aimed for a professional life or something higher sort of thing. Uh, even if we go to one of the slides, I have quoted the speech by uh, John Eliot Drinkwater Bethune in 1849 during the opening of the school. It's a long quotation, so I won't read, but uh, I would like to highlight a few points over here where he talks about the, enhance, um, the educated, newly educated woman who could enhance and uh, enhance by charm which can be thrown over it by graceful virtues and elegant accomplishment of well-educated women. So uh, the well-educated woman was considered to bring about some new ideas into the family and be a better mother and look after the needs of the family in a better way. Uh, nothing more was aimed beyond this. Even if she was educated, she was her life was limited to within the four walls and the domestic life. It was in uh, such a scenario that we find uh, Dr. Kadumini Ganguly, uh, not Dr. Kadumini Ganguly, Kadumini Basu coming up and becoming the first female doctor. Actually, um, she herself was uh, interested in becoming a doctor right from her childhood, but uh, it was a difficult situation right at that moment because uh, the society would never allow, as my earlier participant has said, uh, society did not allow women to take up science and go into higher studies. And as I have said, education for women was mainly the basic type of education with uh, reading and writing and little bit of math. No one ever aimed at higher education for women. Uh, it was Darukanath Ganguly uh, who for the first time tried to bring equality in the syllabus, school syllabus of both male and female. And due to this intention of his, he had to be separate from the, he had to get separate from the Brahmo Shamaj and carry on with his mission of uh, bringing parity in the education for women. He was the, he 
teacher who trained, he started a school, he started two schools. One was Hindu Mahila Vidyalay, another was Bongo Mahila Vidyalay. And uh, to train students, he started with just five students and everything was done by him, starting from teaching, giving books. He trained his students uh, for higher education and it was only Kadamini Basu who took up the university education. It was very difficult to get uh, to persuade the vice chancellor to give her to grant to get the permission for a female student for higher education. But it was uh, Darkana's hard work and his reformative zeal and his desire to bring women to the forefront that allowed Kadambini Basu to qualify the entrance examination. And it was Kadambini along with another student who qualified in the entrance examination in uh, 1879. So that was the first hurdle that uh, the two together crossed with Kadamini on the forefront and Daruka Nath supporting her all throughout her uh, efforts. Next we find Kadamini qualifying for the medical entrance test. The first woman to have means who desired to become a doctor and qualified the medical test. Uh, it was the year 1883. But even then, things were very difficult. Herself being the single candidate, female candidate in the entire medical college, it was a big hurdle to be overcome by Padumbini. But she was not alone on her, uh, what to say, on her uh, Mm, uh, fight to get her degree. It was uh, Dharatanath's presence was constantly by her side, and in the year 1886, she qualified as the first medical uh, female medical doctor, but without qualifying one of her papers. And due to that reason, she was given the degree of uh, GBMC and not MB, which is generally given to the medical students. It was, and uh, she started to practice in uh, Lady Dufferin Hospital. And further, she also went to the West to get her higher degrees in the year 1893. Along with the professional life, she also did, uh, she also was in the socio-political front also. But that too, uh, with the support of um, Darganath Danguli, who fought for the women's representation uh, in the Indian National Congress in 1885 and got her the seat in uh, 1889. She represented the women candidates in the Indian National Congress in 1889. So even if we see a number of men who had been pushing women into the um, Andhra Mahal or the Antarpur or the domestic uh, life, but it was the Z of Samur uh, Sharmat whose endeavors to bring women to the forefront uh, just uh, made Kadambini break the glass ceiling and made her what, uh, and uh, means allowed her to create the history. The achievements of Dr. Kadumbini Ganguly is the story of the earliest female emancipation in pre-partition India. It is the story of how a single woman smashed the glass ceiling and shattered all stereotypes to become a trailblazer for generations to come, especially in a society infested by elitist and narrow-minded precepts set by the urban educated Bhojolo. But this journey for the first female from the darkened passages of Andhra Mahal to the enlightened world of education and liberalism would have hardly been achieved without the reformative spirit and support by mainly Darukanath Ganguly, Brother Kishore Basu, who was her father, and uh, Monomohan Ghosh, her cousin brother in Kolkata, who also helped her a lot to get through all these difficulties in her life, and some of the compatriots of Brahmo Shamaj. Hence, it was not only Kadumbiri, but the stalwarts whose crusades for granting equal status to females made Dr. Kadumbini Ganguly the representative figure of this journey from Andhra Mahal to a professional world. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Bandhapadhyay. Uh, I now throw this open. Uh, if you have any questions, we can give you a minute or two for that. Uh, is there any questions here on this paper? Uh, I uh, I just have a, a one question for uh, Ms. Bandhapadhyay. 
and thank you for your paper it is well researched and uh, we do get a picture of kadamini ganguli who is also now quite popular because thanks to uh, the television serial also now these days we have been able to you know get a insight into her private life but um would you think uh, since you have highlighted on her the presence of her husband her father and her cousin monmohan ghosh uh, uh does that undermine her uh, uh, achievement or uh, can we say that feminine emancipation uh, can only be successful with uh, Uh, with when patriarchy supports and uh, inspires her uh see uh, darkanath inspired her but uh, from the very beginning she herself wanted to be a doctor it was uh, she did not meet darkanath right in her childhood and uh, yes darkanath was supportive because like the other compatriots of um, uh, brahma samaj like keshab chandra sen and several others who wanted to keep women within the domestic wall uh, darkanat never wanted to keep uh, kadambini within the domestic world she was a mother she was a wife but darkanat always inspired her and the inspiration was only because the duo wanted to or bring about a social change it was uh, the social change that they wanted to show to the entire world and about uh, brojo kishore basu uh, who was kadambini's father he was also quite inspiring because in those day, those were the days of early marriage uh, brojo kishore basu could have forced her daughter into early marriage because uh, if we calculate uh, she was born in the year 1861 and when she married Dar- ka nat ganguli she was um, she married when she got after getting through a medical entrance in the year 1883 so at the age of 22 years she married so before that she was never forced to marry anyone she was allowed to go to the school uh, though she was born in bhagalpur she was allowed to go to kolkata for her higher studies over there she was received uh, she received a warm welcome by um, uh, her cousin monomohan ghosh who also so allowed her to uh, achieve her dreams no one hindered her so you know i think the society uh, is formed of both male and female uh, we are there to support everyone uh, if it, if the males don't support the females uh, i think things become very difficult even at some point there is okay. uh, uh, i i do understand what you're trying to say but in most cases it is kadambini was lucky to have a uh, positive yeah. people around her exactly yeah, exactly because they good. wanted to bring a reformation they wanted to show that to the world that such things can be done okay thank you so much thank you madam uh, okay now we uh, may this time for us to call our uh, third speaker uh, may i invite uh, debottama ghosh she is an mphil student from vishwabharati university and her topic is the emerging bhadra mahila of colonial bengal shubarno lata's journey from the periphery to the center thank you so much that's a wonderful topic okay over to you debottama uh, hi am i audible yes you are you yes, you are good morning uh, good evening madam and thank you to host welcome for organizing this seminar uh, since we have a limited assigned time i will uh, move right into my points of argument about the uh, hybrid ground of emerging colonial city which provided the perfect space for the conceivement of the idea of the new woman and the ideal bhadra mahila of the renaissance bengal uh, for this i have uh, i have limited my uh, study to ashokona devi's 1964 novel pratham pratisruti and i have used the translated version by indira choudhury calcutta whose uh, very birth happened to be the confluence of the three villages mimicked in more than one way what a western urban dwelling would look like 
However, the problem of simplifying Calcutta as an other to London is on one hand the complete erasure of its history and the role Western colonial dominance played in its inception. Secondly, in trying to mimic both the Western norms of cultural modernity as well as being inhabited by people who have had a completely different socio-cultural evolution would lend it the characteristics of being a hybrid space with unique heterogeneity. I will try to place this city, which will become Shubhanalata's dwelling ground theoretically, because I feel that it's important for us to realize that this breeding urbanity will provide different points of intersection for the male and female colonial subject. Uh, I have mainly cited Western theoreticians here. Uh, Max Weber had perceived that urbanity was quite specific to Occidental civilization, whereas the Asiatic and Islamic societies were inherently patrimonial or prebendary. Western feudalism gradually paved way for market economy, precepts of which was based on profit making, ultimately leading to capitalism. The culture of city and the characteristic features of urbanity are intrinsically linked with this economic structure. Henry Lafavre, in his 1968 seminal book, The Right to the City, perceived that the 19th century industrial capitalism gave rise to a city culture where everything was commoditized. Like Karl Marx, Lafavre saw the city as an object of power struggle because its space is a commodity controlled by the state. I will like to argue that this power struggle in controlling this colonial space in case of Bengal happened in various ways. On one hand, it was definitely a part of the British imperial politics that wanted to give birth to a set of citizens, Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, morals, and in opinion. However, as we know, any sort of cultural imposition does not go without mimicry on part of the imposed, where they set to write back against the empire. Macaulay's minister on education meant that these colonial subjects now had the opportunity to get a glimpse of what Western enlightenment looked like. And Shubhanarata fell in the midst of this cultural awakening where Bengal was looking at a renaissance which mingled tradition with modernity. The new modes in this colonial city either superseded or modified ideas of traditional culture the Eurocentric view of James Mill, Thomas Babington Macaulay, and the Orientalist view of Warren Hastings, William Jones, H. H. Wilson, and the modern consciousness of people like Raja Ram Mohan Roy, Ishwar Chandra Vidyashagar, Keshav Chandra Sen, the Tego family of Jora Sako, the spirit of young Bengal group, and the nationalist spirit of Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay, and the reformation. late 18th century and early 19th century Bengal. My next argument is that since this hybrid dwelling space is only seeing its inception and is young in its age and conception, it provides a space where traditional ideas can be played around with, which is precisely what Shobhanalata makes use of. She is able to go on her journey of self-realization and empowerment because she is residing in this hybrid space. Here, I wish to quote from the novel to locate this parallel journey of the woman and the city. And I quote, the earth is dumb, they say, but the soil of Calcutta has a tongue. For nature has blessed this city with all the sprightliness and loquacity of a young girl. The novel Pratham Pratisruti maps the life of Shrottavati from an age of eight, the sprightly young girl, to a grown woman whose journey into womanhood becomes a mirror to contradictions and debates between tradition and modernity in contemporary Bengali society. Shrottavati's very life becomes an act of rebellion against age-old customs that remain steeped in Indian rural tradition and which gradually paved way for the birth of the new age woman because of her rebellion against it, who finds and establishes her identity in a city which itself is new on its journey to carve out its own identity in the heydays of colonial modernity. The novel becomes with a self-reflexive proclamation about the need to repay one's debts to one's grandmothers 
this reminded me a great deal about Audrey Lords in search of our mother's garden as well as wolf positioning the need of women to be the torch bearers of their own literary tradition and charting down their own experiential reality in room of one's own and as we see this is Pratham Pratishruti becomes the first of the trilogy and this is precisely what happens here Shruti's story we learn right at its outset is collected from the notebook of Bukul. I would like to cite from the text uh, her acting, uh, uh, her, her rebellions against normativity and refusal to accept traditional femininity. Uh, firstly, she learns uh, to read and write. She learns the script, memorizes slokes along with her male childhood friend Nehru. Uh, then while playing, with her, uh, playing during her childhood days in the playhouse under the ba banyan tree, which was a which which almost looked like a flawless setup that mimicked perfectly the playroom that kept grown-ups busy. Let's go, Punni. I quote her words. Let's go, Punni. I cannot stand this anymore. It's as though my heart's being wrenched. So what shall? Uh, so here comes her conjecture. So what shall have a woman's identity be confined to? Who is one who is supposed to build a family, a caregiver, a nurturer? Where lies her own subjective self? So these are the questions that that were in Ashobanurata right from her childhood days. And thirdly, she declares to her mother with as, as much conviction as she can master, uh, uh, being a young girl. Uh, and I quote: Many women read and write in Calcutta. I will will go to Calcutta just to check out for myself if a woman is struck down by thunder when she steps into the city. Shratta definitely had her moments of doubt when she sees her dream of living in Calcutta becoming a reality where she can be found wondering if the city will understand her or would she be living there like an outsider, as someone to be pitied. There had been numerous questions in Shrutta's mind associated with Kolkata, uh, Calcutta, sorry. Would she lose caste if she went there? Would they have to drink water provided by the lectures? And on the other hand, it was the dream of the new world where she might get the chance to ride a feet into Maidan. On one hand, was the life of luxury where food can be bought from sweet shops where horse driven coaches have replaced palkis and bullock carts and a city which has, has its own sense of decorum and code of conduct starting from attire to language. Uh, as the neurolinguists will say that language changes as a process in which a dominant speech community exerts pressure over the subordinate communities. So the language of the city becomes the hegemonic dialect which overrules the language of the marginalized communities. To become a part of this city, one has to acclimatize himself or herself to the ways of the city or else they remain a constant outsider. Shubhanulata does acclimatize herself and soon carves out her own space in the city and finds her individual identity separate from the family. Time spent trying to adapt herself to the clock time, that is the office time where she has to cook for her husband before he's leaving for office in the mornings, prepare her children for school, then complete all the household chores and try to adjust to the new class demarcations the city offered where her being Brahmin felt subservient to her social position as one who is only a lower middle class tenant trying to make ends meet. Gives her, uh, ultimately gives way to her involvement with the Brahma Samaj ideals and Young Bengal movement and her attempt to learn English, the so-called lectures language. At time, at times, uh, Shotto has idealized 19th century Calcutta as the city of Ram Mohan Roy with the Shagar Devendranath Tagore. It is the city that offers Shotto the opportunity to witness the meeting between uh, Keshav Chandra Sen, the Brahmo leader, and Ram Krishna Paramahansa. But she has also been disgusted with the opulence and arrogance of the urban reach, the dandified babus who had appeared to her as city bred louts ugly and detestable. 
this becomes an occasion to reflect on the superfluous self importance of the wealthy in the city there are moments we see that dreams uh, turn into failure or show glimpses of darkness through the broken glasses where these promises of social reformation fail to meet up or reach every corner Besides, Shortabhati is a figure like Shankari, the child widow whose deprivations and sufferings occupied a very significant part of the social reform agenda of 19th century Bengal. The sexual exploitations of child widows that moved social reformers like Vidya Tagore to campaign for the Widow Remarriage Act that was finally passed in 1856. Even though Vidya Tagore's efforts were blazed with legislation, the social acceptance of widow remarriage remained a fantasy. Through Shankar's story, the harsh fate, harsh fate of a remarried widow is evident, who is abandoned by her husband soon after announcing her pregnancy. The life Shankar leads afterwards, hiding away her daughter as a widowed girl to protect her from the sexual abuse, provides a glimpse of life of women in a city where they have no one to look after them. Shankar's daughter, who is raised by Shota after her demise, and Shubhana, her only uh, girl child, both of whom Shota tried to educate with great enthusiasm, ultimately was based on the hope that times will change for a woman in this new breeding ground of the city space. While Shota was successful in educating Shubhash, her dream about her own daughter was cut short when her husband and mother in law married her off following the same customs of goridan without shubha uh, uh, without shottavati's knowledge or consent to conclude it uh, ma- i must mention that the equation between the city and the village this movement of shubhanalata from the periphery to the center is not one of failure but rather a social reality where dreams did not remain achievable always where struggle for female empowerment remained a lifelong trial often to be meted with hopelessness and despair ashobona devi continuously played with this figurative dimensions of the twin spaces transforming the geographical terms into metaphors of both suppleness and inflexibility the city constantly makes remakes and unmakes the characters and for shobona the moving to calcutta remained a journey to find the joy of freedom and open sparkling sky above instead of a sword dangling over her head thank you uh, thank you very much uh, debottama that was a very well prepared paper and uh, we as bengalis we all agree that the trilogy of ashapurna devi is one of the most feminist texts that was written and it actually if we start from pratham pratishruti and go on to bokul katha it is just a trajectory of the you know the birth and growth and evolution of the bengali woman yes uh, but i also liked those uh, parts where you highlighted the the racial aspect as well you know the mlecho and the um, uh, bhadralok and yes. also you did um, you know put your uh, importance on the awareness of this change of place where topos and a place calcutta itself becomes a kind of a character in the yes. novel specifically mm-hmm. to bond yes. lata shotobuti somehow attunes calcutta to a kind her of own a, journey her own journey and her dreamland a kind of a paradise which was also lost actually when she yes. could not yes. save yes. her daughter uh, so, yes uh, thank you so much thank uh, you ma'am <laughs> we have uh, somebody uh, who has uh, origit sharkar says the economic structure or design is definitely behind urbanization but the innumerable social reflections be it regarding women or culture and the quest for personal identity amidst layers or isms has all been a continuous presence as a humble rural being contracted in fact an urban characteristic is evidently visible often in a village for that matter so it's an amalgamated movement hope you agree to uh, 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 absolutely uh, i do agree to it because uh, without this amalgamation shotivad uh, 
Shakti's movement to this city wouldn't have been possible. It's only because this this idea of colonial uh, modernity was reaching the villages. Navakuma did receive uh, Shotabati's husband. I mean, we did receive this English education. Master Moshai was someone who was first uh, in the village, giving uh, giving out these educations only to move to the city and join the Young Bengal movement. So, without these cultural amal amalgamations between both the margin and the center, it wouldn't have been possible. For, for these people to understand what, what this cultural modernity will mean to them. Thank you very much. Uh, it was really a very, very enjoyable paper. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And since we have no questions here, let us move on to the last uh, speaker of this panel. Uh, may I invite Nibedi Tapal? She's a senior doctoral research fellow in the, at the center, uh, Central University of Gujarat. And her paper is uh, titled Nationalism and Politics Through Bina Dasha's Memoir. Uh, over Hello. to you, Nivedita. Hello. Good, uh, good evening. Am I audible? Uh, um, a little louder would be better. Yes, you are audible. Uh, I'll just take a moment to present my screen. Sure. We are running short of time, so Nivedita, if you would just hurry up a little, dear. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just a moment. If there is a problem, why don't you read your paper? If there is a problem, I'm just, I'm just going, uh, going along with the paper. In case uh, I can present the PPT, then I'll. Sure, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. sure. That would be good. Uh, so, good evening, everyone present here. I am Nivedi Tapal, currently a PhD uh, program up. in the Department of Comparative Literature. Oh, okay. Yes, it has come. Yeah. Uh, ma'am, is it okay? Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, I'm uh, in the Department of Comparative Literature and Translation Studies at Central University of Gujarat, Gandhinagar. The paper I'm presenting here today is titled Nationalism and Politics through Bina Das's Memoir. I have taken Das's autobiographical narrative, translated into English by Dira Dhar and published by Zuba Publication in 2010. The original Bengali text was published in 1950 under the title Shrinkhal Jhonkar, meaning Sounds of Chain. Das was born in 1911, and her personal narrative is the first political autobiography by a Bengali woman. Had not women actively participated in nationalism and adhered to ecritude feminine, the genre of political memoir in regional language would not have existed. Apart from her autobiography and a novel commemorating her father, the scholar Beni Madhav Dash, who also happened to be the teacher and influencer of Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose at Ravenshaw Collegiate School, Veena Das had extensively contributed articles to the journal Mondira and Joyshri. Das, a student of Dai Session School and Bethun College in Calcutta, first came into limelight when during the convocation ceremony of the University of Calcutta, held on 6 February 1932, she had tried to shoot Sir Stanley Jackson, the then governor of Bengal. This is a newspaper clipping from Glasgow Herald, a Scottish newspaper. Sir Stanley Jackson was the governor of Bengal from 1927 to 1932 and was also a notable cricketer in his former days. Das was sentenced to nine years of rigorous imprisonment and later on due to her association with the Quit India movement was imprisoned again for three years. This is a newspaper clipping from Reading Eagle, an English paper. Uh, due to the short of time, I'm not reading the quotation, but this portion, if you all could just read up. 
this is also from her memoir. Uh, repeatedly, we see that Das has said that her anger was vented against the system and not personally at anyone. In her courtroom confession, she expressed deep regard for the Western education system and the Christian nun teachers of her institute, who too harbored deep affection for her. Social reforms had already been engineered from the 18th century, and by the end of the 19th century came in the burgeoning demand for Sri Shiksha, where on one side the Bengali patriarchy wanted to bring reform in the nation from the domestic quarters. Similarly, on the other side, the British administrators wanted their Indian civil servants to have English educated wives to continue the ensured loyalty. The new Bengali women were educated, rational minded, and ready to participate in the socio-political movements against the hegemony. However, women's participation in the public arena created an aberration with the social nexus as picketing and political demonstrations exposed women to the British administrators. The Bengali patriarchy still anchored onto the notion of women's chastity and respectability, cohering which would definitely restrict women's action in public sphere. The periodical started to entwine religious concepts to the idea of incarceration as in an article, they had described the imprisonment of women to that of Goddess Lakshmi or Griha Lakshmi, the concept being in vogue then, of the Bengali home being in jail to fight the demon ruler. Most popular anecdote was equating of prisoners to various incarnations of the Hindu god Narayan. A woman prisoner's mother had said that she would like to imagine her daughter as Prahlad, the disciple of Narayan, when one day God would break the prison door and unite the mother and daughter. Various legends of Krishna were reiterated as Krishna's birth in prison had purged the space. Even though religious sanctions gave women the added motivation to go to prison for the sake of their motherland, yet this same incongruity of enmeshing religion and nationalism has been a common preoccupation of every age. Reminiscent of this was Sri Aurobindo's tryst with Krishna in the presidency jail, which is elaborately written about in his Tales of Prison Life the Bengali version being Kara Kahini. Initially, women from various Brahmo and upper middle class houses answered to their country's beckoning, and it was only after 1928, through the scavengers' protest and jute mill strike, that women from the lower rung of the society participated in the protests and rallies, which rose out of their need to liberate themselves from unfortunate working conditions. The women from educated background shared close-knit families of circle and a liberal relation with their parents. Bina Das reminiscence how strong a bond she shared with her mother. This is again a quotation from her uh, memoir. This, uh, uh, once we read this quotation, we can understand that how easily the uh, picture of the mother-daughter diet is built up. Adrian Rich is of the opinion that motherhood as an institution was founded on the assumptions of patriarchy, which trivialized the female experiences and overlooked the delicate nuances binding the duo. The image of the mother as constructed by Das is unique as she perceives her mother as a dynamic participant in the upbringing of her daughters. Das recognizes the intellectual depth and political inspiration she derived through the relationship and intimate bonding with the mother who could contain her emotions with self-restraint and courage inspired most of the women who dared to devote themselves to work outside their family. Similarly, fathers were not the only revered beings, but were also affectionate in nature towards their daughters. Credit for the system had to be levied to the new family structure that was employed in the Bengali household. The detachment of the nuclear family from the joint family setup made the parents have a greater contact with the children. Das's elder sister, Kolani, was in prison because of her association with, uh, with the non-cooperation movement when Veena was arrested for attempting to shoot Sir Jackson. Kolani recalled that regarding her temporary imprisonment, her parents were anxious, even though her mother had calmly extended her encouragement. However, she pondered as to how her parents would hold their ground when they learned about Veena's arrest. Regarding the source of the pistol, which Veena used, the intelligence bureau officer coaxed Bina's parents, to which she had protested, saying that her parents had never taught her to be a traitor. The pistol was provided by Komala Dashgupto, and the mention of it is found in her autobiography of Rokter Okkore. The young fighters mostly practiced shooting during the night of Diwali to muffle the noise, but as Bina had no provision for target practice, 
So she had missed the governor. However, five consecutive shots from her pistol had conferred upon her the title Ogni Konna. This is the picture of Dukori, uh, sorry, Noni Baladevi. Prison from the 18th century harbored rebellious peasants and criminals. However, as women started to be arrested for public demonstrations, there rose a greater challenge for the prison authorities. Noni Baladevi became the first state prisoner in Bengal in 1818, bearing inhuman tortures with Dukori Baladevi. Noni Baladevi was arrested for giving shelter to the leaders associated with the Indo-German plot under the Third Bengal State Prisoners Regulation of 1818. Under this norm, the administration could detain anyone indefinitely without a trial on the basis of suspicion of criminal intent. This was enacted by the East India Company in the Presidency of Bengal in the 1818, following suit in the presidencies of Bombay and Madras. Previously, women's participation in the nation's cause was restricted to the literary space or through the practice of Swadeshi. As they started to join the Gandhi-led movement or answer to the call of the extremists, prison experience became an integral and necessary part of their life. Women's literary oeuvre exposed the oppression and arbitrary nature of the state apparatus. Barbara Harlow, in her essay, Third World Women's Narratives of Prison, says that these political autobiographies are unhackneyed in nature as they record women's experience of defiance against an authoritarian regime. Women's collective encounter was solely constructed on a bond beyond caste, creed, and gender. What happens in prison is a reflection of what happens in the society outside. And in this regard, we can say that the 18th century prison was quite similar to the Antopur, that is the inner quarters of the house reserved for women. Both were dismal and airless. Food was inedible in prison. Women prisoners were poked fun at by male authorities. And often to the embarrassment of women prisoners, they were sent to toilets with male guards. Things underwent a change when the middle class women started to frequent the cells. They were from respectable families and educated with university degrees. These women had spent their best years in prison and brought in alterations with their refined taste. However, Fear is an integral factor to the architecture of prison and to instill it, the first step that the authorities took was to paint the prison walls with black tar. David Arnold in his essay, The Colonial Prison, has said that as opposed to the Benthamite Panopticon prison model, considered to be the ideal, the colonial prison norms showed religious tolerance. Still, such events were common when prison administrators exhibited sternness in allowing preferences to the prisoners. Protests were held, letters were written to allow plain white saris to widowed women prisoners and bordered saris to others. Pina Das mentioned in her writing how the C category prisoners had to wear uncomfortable short gowns instead of sun. She herself had helped another political prisoner with her kurta, which the jailer snatched away, calling it a fashionable blouse. In spite of all the hardships, women found ways to survive in the abysmal prison conditions instances of cooking with scarce ration for ailing prisoners or for those leaving the jail lays the memoir. The seasonal changes were distinct and often it brought back memories of home. Das had placed bail and rogenic on the flowers inside her ward when she was humiliated for turning the cell into a luxurious room. The public and the private space diffused into one as the prison, considered to be the public arena, was refurbished with the doctrines of domesticity. With abundant time in one's hand, Das said that prison became the best place to meditate on one's life's quest. It gave one time to read, write, and teach. Das helped many young girls with their studies as young women opted to clear examinations while in prison. Political discussions regarding events of the daily newspaper were all essential part of prison life. Even though life was stagnant, yet prisoners knew that once they were out of confinement, they could be actively absorbed into nationalistic works. The outside was devoid of any motivation, so prisoners were forced to look within to discover the elixir of life. With a busy life in the city, one hardly gets any time for one's own self. So without these years in prison, Das confesses, she could not have ameliorated her personality. Bonding between female political and criminal prisoners all, and also between male and female prisoners grew out of mutual respect and by enduring similar experiences. When Bina Das had started a hunger strike to transfer a libertine jailer, the ordinary prisoners promptly refused to eat, supporting her cause. On being admitted in the prison hospital, the male prisoners of Rajshani jail had sent her biscuits, soap, cream, and oil to extend their solidarity. 
it was a common practice to shout out Bande Mataram in jail when new political prisoners arrived, which was a way to communicate, which was a way of communication between prisoners with similar cause. In a place where words were barred, gifts, signs, slogans became a way to respond to and support one another. This act of leaving behind signs and tokens for the other person to recognize was also a common practice by the Jews in the Nazi imprisonment camps. In solitude or under constant suppression from state coercion, the need for company became a challenge for the prisoners. Das had also extended her support to the non-criminal lunatics in prison, which had nonetheless increased her admirers. Women like Bina Das had extensively contributed to the anti-colonial movement, thus advancing the country towards its freedom. Das had also spoken about the good-natured government officials who did their duty by obeying the crown, but also helped the young rebels in ways unthinkable, which being, while being deported, Das was surreptitiously given a paper to write a letter to her parents so that they stay informed about her whereabouts. Later in her life, Das became a member of the Bengal Legislative Assembly from 1946 to 1951. After the death of her husband, she became a recluse and spent her last days in Rishikesh. Bina Das's rebellious spirit against the oppressive government started from, the very, started from a very young age when during an examination, she did not shudder from writing an affirmative essay on Shorat Chandra Chattopadhyay's Pothet Dabi, which was a banned literature then and had the audacity to publicly call the novel her favorite. Such rich legacy of women's potential in colonial India is proof enough for the mobilization of women's strength for a greater achievement at a future date, unknown to the cognition and perceptions of the past. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. That was a very interesting paper. And it throws another light. I'm sure we have had a very rich session here. Um, anybody who would like to ask any question to Nivedita is welcome. And I found your paper very interesting, especially uh, uh, places where you have, you know, sort of drawn similarities with uh, 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 the concentration camps and how <clears throat> women were meted out and how Indian uh, female uh, freedom struggle fighters. And it is also a very interesting, you know, sort of focus on the role of female um, uh, feminist interpretation and feminist involvement in our freedom struggle. It is a sad thing that Vinadash died a very sad and a very unfortunate death. Her decomposed body was found on the streets of Rishikesh and it took one month to identify that it was indeed India's great freedom strugglist, Vinadash. So that is of course another tragedy like many women who have sacrificed their lives and have ended in penury. Uh, thank you so much Nivedita. Since uh, uh, there are, I think uh, Mr. Origit Sharkar has written a comment, standing up for the cause of the nation was therefore leading to realization of women power, or would you put it the other way, that the leadership and devotion of women was awakening an entire nation, all the more vigorously for the clarion cause. Bina Das was an emblem. So I think that's a comment to, that adds to your paper. Thank you so much. We are already running five minutes short, and Ramanuj is uh, getting tensed up for the next session. So we will wind up here today. And thank you so much to all the four participants for throwing light on the medical, the freedom struggle, and the struggle of uh, a, a, a woman protagonist of Asha Kunda Devi, who sort of brought about a marked change in the consequences and in the conception of the woman of Bengal. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Sharbani Banerjee, my Didi, Didi, thank you so much. You have always been there. Uh, 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 you have been a meticulous reviewer for our journal. You have always been there. And to today also, thank you so much. And I, I would like to also thank the paper presenters, uh, Shormita Re, Meeta Bondabadda, Devutama Ghosh, and Nivedita Pal. We are now uh, moving on to our business session two, which will be chaired by Dr. Jyoti Shankar Mundal, who is uh, uh, an assistant professor of English at Shidu Kano Desha University and is also one of the members of the 
uh, editorial advisory board of our journal and the paper presenters in this session are stella chitralekha bishash ognibho maiti camellia boiraggo and dipannita borua the first paper presenter just informed me that she could not be uh, uh, here to present the paper maybe some ki kind of connectivity problem she is staying or traveling at a place so dipannita uh, uh, borua is not go going to present her pa paper now so we have three three paper presenters over to you uh, dr mondal thank you ramanuj and welcome everybody in the second business session of uh, young researchers international webinar um, in the evolution of bengali identity so without uh, speaking much as we are running short of time i would like to request stella chitralekha vishwas to present her paper and to introduce herself uh, you have 15 minutes so okay, please sir. am i audible yes you are good evening everyone uh, my name is stella chitralekha vishwas and i am a phd scholar at the center for comparative literature and translation studies central university of gujarat uh, before i begin my paper i must confess that i'll be speaking a little quickly because of the dearth of time which i hope will not be too inconvenient for all the listeners so the title of my paper is daughters of the nation revisiting women's speculative writings in bengal in this paper considering select writings from rokia rochnaboli that is complete works of rokia shakavat hosain and khirur khata which translates as miscellany by leela mojumdar i intend to locate certain counter tropes in the realm of bengali speculative writing that challenge the dominant trope of the masculinist hero that which had remained a staple discursive construct in bengali juvenile literature up to the late 19th century the choice of these two particular women writers from different socio cultural and communal backgrounds is deliberate for a number of reasons firstly owing to the crucial accommodation of the muslim voice within the larger reform project surrounding the woman question in colonial bengal which predominantly appear to focus upon the emancipation of the middle class hindu bhatra mahila Secondly, in order to gauge the significance of such alternate discourses in both the colonial and post-independence years in Bengal, and thirdly, to develop a holistic, critical comparison of the genre and thematic experimentations with this realm of writing that the two aforementioned authors and thinkers were engaged in, what I intend to locate are certain disruptions inflicted upon the ideology of assertive native masculinity. by the alternate models of female agency and power celebrated by hussein and mojumdar in their speculative visions of emancipated womanhood the innate gendering and asymmetrical bifurcation of socio cultural roles in the historiography of bengali juvenile literature is problematized and countered by these women writers whose demystifying agenda exposes the breaches latent in the myth of male superiority and its dynamics in the nationalist discourse in a consciously subversive almost utopian agenda what is ultimately celebrated in these speculative works are notions of female efficiency and the dire need or the dire necessity rather for uh, gender equality speculative writings in bengal have a history of being evidentially rooted in the tensions of colonial rule straddling the two apparently diverse strains of indigenous knowledge systems and western scientific thought this novel genre that made its advent in the early 20th century in colonial bengal went on to become a staple part of bengali literary output at the efforts of the stalwarts who were emphatically involved with the bengal renaissance initially at least speculative writings were largely the forte of the male patrilok intelligentsia who envisioned the crucial necessity of reorienting the native mindset in scientific rationalist principles that would alleviate the shortcomings of superstitious beliefs and burn out traditional tenets of thinking despite women's education having achieved considerable momentum by then in bengal very few women writers ventured in the realm of empirical science which was believed to be an exclusively masculine territory even a few women like norindra bala devi labono prabha basu obuni bosu and dr shushila devi attempted attempted such writings yet their output tended to be uh, more mythologically oriented and light hearted owing to their feminine disposition illustrious names like jagodanand roy jc bose hemendra kumar roy upendra kishor roy choudhury uh, shukumar re premendra mitra vibhuti vishan bandopadhyay etc 
were actively involved with the mission of utilizing speculative writings to address certain racial anxieties pertaining to masculinity, rationality, civilizational progress, etc. Subversion, parity, and rectification of colonial stereotypes were the key tools of this intelligentsia to negotiate with their own sociocultural aspirations and concerns. In contrast to the wealth of writings produced by them, very few women writers of speculative fiction remain extant, namely Rokia Shakhavat Hussain, Leela Mojumdar, Shukhalata Rao, to name a handful. However, it would be interesting to look at the alternative trajectory which the writings of the latter group follow in their addressal of a wide range of issues, nationalism, gender disparity, modernity, emancipation, etc. Rokia Shakhavat Hussain remains a celebrated figure, not just in the history of women's speculative writings, but through the overall rich contribution she made to the women's movement in colonial Bengal. A strong advocate of women's education and professional opportunities, Hussain crusaded all throughout her active years against the tyrannical onslaught of fundamentalist Islam and its regressive customs. Founder of the Shakhavat Memorial Girls High School in 1911 and the Anjuman e Khawateni Islam Association of Muslim Women in 1916, she championed the education and vocational training of Muslim women, a cause which she found alarmingly neglected in the nationalistic visions of reform. In this paper, I have looked at three of her well-known speculative pieces, Ganpal, which translates as the fruit of knowledge, Mukti Paul, which translates as the fruit of emancipation, both of which were published in the second volume of Muti Chur that came out in 1922. And lastly, Sultana's Dream, which was first published in 1905 in the Indian Ladies' Journal. Dan Paul and Mukti Paul come across as innovative experimentations with the genre possibilities offered by Bengali speculative fiction. The fable or fairy tale approach adopted by Hussein in a satirical critique of both colonial rule and the nationalist movement uh, particularly the divisive ideologies that she, that she found in the Congress party is particularly telling. Ganpal utilizes the theological story of the creation of man and woman, expanding further into a different imaginary narrative that culminates in underlining the absolute necessity of female intervention and participation for the sustenance of meaningful existence. Conjuring up a fantastic world of jinns, fairies, humans, demons, magic gardens, islands, and dream prophecies, Hossein constructs a magical and yet realistic narrative that scathingly critiques uh, the materialism and greed of the foreign rulers whose policies have an incapacitating impact upon the lives and activities of the colonized group. What emerges out of this fictionalized novum is the dire necessity for equal female participation in educational and other related intellectual pursuits that would act as a redemptive influence against such a dystopic outcome. In Mukti, Pol, sorry, in Mukti Pol, Hussein goes a step further to challenge the trope of the enslaved motherland awaiting the sons to uh, awaiting the active participation of her competent sons to deliver her towards emancipation. Again, utilizing the speculative mechanisms of jinns, magical, uh, fantastic jungles, castles, and an equally allegorical demography, Hossein exposes the inherently biased nature of nationalistic endeavors that are inevitably destined to meet failure. She satirically interrogates the normatively celebrated ideologies of a masculinist body politic, highlighting the flawed perceptions of nationalism as an exclusively male prerogative. The optimistic ending of the narrative harps upon a feminist speculation and futuristic vision of emancipated assertive womanhood as the vehicle for propagating actual liberation and civilizational progress beyond the clutches of colonial enslavement. In Sultana's dream, the complete subversion of the gendered assumptions of socio-political and economic independence, agency and efficiency leads to the celebration of a feminist utopian space, Ladyland, where women are the rulers and men the subjects. Unlike Charlotte Perkins Gilman's Herland, which came out in 1915, which completely effaced men from the face of society, Hossein's work dismantles the asymmetries of colonial reforms that championed gender disparate discourses. Attributing the idea of mobility, technological progress, and effective administration, coupled with a sense of order and feminine aesthetics, Lady, Lady Land, with its free women, raises unsettling questions about the regressive traditions that throttle possibilities of competent womanhood. Very cheekily substituting the idea of the Zanana with the Mardana, Hossein deconstructs the patriarchal logic of keeping women grounded, isolated, and shorn of any scope for mobility. 
In fact, it is the men who are condemned brutally for being predatory purveyors of rape culture and inherently prone to destruction. In juxtaposition, women are venerated for their sustainable visions of governance, maintenance of law and order, and steady ecocentric socio-economic progress that in turn contributed to the peace and prosperity of a growing nation. Thus, in this imaginative utopian land, the emasculation of the men folk is proposed as a corrective measure to the otherwise dystopic manifestations of regressive patriarchy in the forms of colonialist or imperialist practices, while also effusively foregrounding models of female leadership, education, and activism within the ambit of nationalism. Turning to Leela Mochumdar, a memorable name in the history of Bengali literature, especially in the realms of fantasy, gothic, and humorous writings, she was a woman who left her indelible mark in the legacy of the Bengal Renaissance. Hailing from a Brahmo family background, Majumdar was herself a zealous reformist and had a particular penchant for debunking stereotypical assumptions about traditional womanhood through her own witty foray into the realm of speculative fiction. She was also associated with a number of organizations all throughout her life that promoted female empowerment like Anandu Mela, which is the Assembly of Joy, and Mohila Atarokha Shamiti, which is the Association for Self-Defense of Women. She also harbored an enduring interest for a wide range of socio-cultural activities, contributing regularly to journals like Shandesh, Mede Kotha, etc. Straddling the time span across both colonial and post-independence Bengal, Mochumdar constructed certain imagined absurdly familiar worlds in her works, especially in her speculative writings, where apparently ordinary people and places are laden with a distinctive flavor of utopian fantasy. In these imagined utopias, the marginal and the liminal are given scope for articulation, and the shifting implications of modernity, tradition, sociocultural ethics, science, etc., are cast in an innovative light. In particular, women are celebrated for their strength, independence, imagination, down to earthness, stubbornness, eccentricity, and mischievousness. Kherul Khatta, uh, arguably one of her ar uh, characteristic attempts to experiment with speculative writing, comprises of snippets from her own life experiences and deals with a wide range of topics pertaining to Bengali socio-cultural subjectivity. She effectively portrays speculative sketches of independent-minded women whose idiosyncratic pragmatism, reasoning capabilities, competence, and intellectual uh, intelligence outsmart their male counterparts, often even ridiculing the inefficacy of the latter. Mojumdar uh, adopts a more humorous, self-reflexive stance in negotiating with the dialectics of modernity and tradition, colonizer and colonized, public and private, etc. In her speculative narratives, woven, uh, sorry, women have uh, the capacity to manage both household work and professional obligations with equal dexterity, thereby obliquely critiquing the nationalist assumptions of masculinist hegemony in, uh, in all spheres. Stories in particular, like Me Chakre, Dodjal Me, Ginni Der Proshonge, and Me Der Kotha, revolve around Zani women whose earthy wit, crazy humor, and inimitable strategies prove to be convenient in all adverse situations, even ones in which traditional masculinist logic or agency fails, despite some of these women being unindoctrinated into conventionally understood fundamentalist knowledge systems they have the capacity to straddle both domestic and professional spheres with equal ease and competence. Interestingly enough, some of them function only within the home and the court, and even do not conform to stereotypical notions of beauty, feminine delicacy, and womanly grace. The heterotopic world which they occupy allow them the scope to express their potential as individual human beings, harboring the capacity to outwit their men folk at times and assert a sense of unprecedented agency in various episodes of their routine life. Perhaps the most memorable character that emerges out of such feminist heterotopic speculations is that of Kotu Devi, who is Sneholata Moitro, the first mathematics graduate in India and a close relative of Mojumdar. Extremely intelligent, whimsical, careless, eccentric, and lovable in her own ways, Potodidi is har uh, harbored an equal love for science and a devotion towards the spiritual philosophy of Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. She has her own uniquely bizarre antidotes for every crisis that often challenge empirical knowledge systems and turn out to be successful in their outcomes. Unaffected, genuinely affectionate, unmaterialistic, generous, and dismissive of class or caste boundaries, 
this woman uses her scientific knowledge to experiment with and solve routine issues ranging from safely packing breakables while moving to house cooling air and, and air ventilation on hot days like the innumerable other memorable women who inhabit these speculative heterotopias and revel in their daily exploits potodidi also deconstructs the hegemonic notions of male authority that happen to be a staple discourse in bengali juvenile literature since the colonial times the men in these heterotopias are lackluster timid and incapable more than often thereby undermining the ideological visions of competent masculinity that was routinely valorized through the majority of 20th century speculative fiction to conclude what my paper has tried to argue for is a deeper investigation that needs to be undertaken in order to call out the subtler nuances of reformation that were embedded within the, these alternative discourses that were proposed by the women writers of speculative fiction bringing to the fore certain significant issues like socio cultural and intellectual participation through a critique of the problematic dynamics and complexities of such issues i have read these works as a futuristic anticipation for greater gender gender equality thank you thank you it was a very wonderful and thought uh, thought provoking uh, paper uh, on celebration of agency of the emancipated womanhood and how you have discussed different modes of speculative writing and how in the first part of the paper you have mentioned that grand fall and mukti fall it was very um, very interesting for me however uh, we will take the questions at the very end of this session so you have to wait and if you dear audience if you have any question or comment please do post it in the comment section of this meeting our next presenter is ognivo maiti and the title of his presentation is transforming identity a study on the cartographic project on the 19th century bengal ognivo i would like to request you to unmute and to start the video and to present your paper uh am i audible yes audible but not visible okay i'm having a little bit problem are you try trying to present your screen yes you are yes. you are visible now, please go ahead right yes please carry on uh Uh, first of all i would like to express my gratitude towards the postscriptum journal uh, and in my paper i am going to discuss about the archival project of the 19th century bengal and the problems of representation of the subaltern subject in this archival project uh, without any further delay i would like to read the title of my paper which is transforming identity a study on the cartographic project of 19th century bengal the ethos of the productionist metaphysics which harbors latent violence towards the existing order of the past can be compared here in the sense of the production of knowledge with the project of cartography that deals with the representation of a globe on a plane the perpetual dilemma embedded in this discourse an inherent and interminable slippage of projection is that it can never be articulated without the indispensable distortion of measurements and proportions while the markata projection for instance culminating the holistic approach of surveying monitoring successfully preserves the acute shape it fails to reproduce the actual dimensions of the represented territory upon the representational space of the map and also it has been subjected to severe criticism for stimulating an eurocentric bias towards the southern hemisphere on the other hand gal peter's projection does exactly the contrary it epitomizes the fantasy of the authentic representation of the unrepresentable of the calculation of the incalculable by leaving permanent traces of its own finitude 
in the discourse of the unending quest of cartographical or the archival truth. Since this desire of systematic archivization is by definition unattainable, unobtainable, even at its embryonic form, it is forced to undergo the repetitive compulsive movement of formation and dissolution over the course of the period. The experience of the subaltern, what may be called the non-ontological sense of being, a denuded existent, a deplorably eluded the trajectory of the theory. Levinas foregrounded the concept of there is, signified by the absence of I, marked by indefinite insomnia, which in his words cannot be intelligibly understood, neither Bergsonian nothingness nor Heideggerian anxiety can conceptualize this fatality of irremissible being. For example, this untranslatability of the speech act also of there is can be found in a comparison between two prominent singers of Goshtashongi, a form of conversational song. In a comparison between two prominent singers, Chandraboti Devi and Shushma Devi, who despite singing together Ajiya Anandu Jogge, differ in their style, tune and pronunciation, and thus simultaneously locating and dislocating their voices in the nexus of the archival presentation. Archive fails to attend, to track the simultaneity of two non-identical, distinct impression originating from the same umbilical cord by displacing or dislodging one or the other. Broadly speaking, this systematized fallacy of deliberate misappropriation explicitly perfects all dominant projector mapping, such as the feminist reading of the marginalized, here the third world, experience to construe a textual body of knowledge, a hermeneutic field of categorization, like true or false experience. Julie Stephens pointed out while taking into account the non-academic rigorous method of interviewing the subaltern subject, that the consciousness constantly remains outside the subaltern subject or the interviewee. The realist mode or fiction, as Julie Stephens used, of encapsulating the direct experience witnesses the uncanny by failing to accommodate the subject's concept of their son as at the reincarnation of their paternal head of the family in the same paragraph. However, this question of subaltern subject formation haunted the grand narrative of the post-colonial archive from the very beginning of the post-colonial discourse even in Bengal. While discussing the genealogy of the subaltern identity, in a recent interview, Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak professed that subaltern could speak but what she meant in her seminal essay, Can the Subaltern Speak, was that the elite class did not allow the subaltern to complete their speech act, which never really permitted the subject formation of the concerned class. Hence, subaltern was left far from being heard. Uh, I am taking an example of Thakur Marjuli here. Texts such as Thakur Marjuli by Dokkina Ranjan Mitra Mojundar was a part of the grand project which aimed the formation and the preservation of the Bengali and nationalist identity. This figure of Thakurma here can be equated with a Deridian absence in the entire text, whose voice, speech act, private space were supplemented and violated by the archons of newly formed Shadeshi literature. In spite of being the stalwart figure of modernity, Rabindranath Tagore could not entrust an educated Bhadramohila to perform the sacred task of retelling the Rupkatha. Although Tagore emphatically praised Dokhinaranjan for engraving or burying, which is the literal translation of the word Putiachilin that Tagore used, grandmother's spoken, word, spoken words to those printed letters, no scene of speaking of Thakurma could arise in this discursive domain. The lacuna of her speech erupts and therefore disrupts the semantics of the narrative with the untranslatable utterances such as how mau khao, which simultaneously also destabilizes the archaeo of Bengali intellectuals. 
Now the construction of the other necessitates the annihilation of subjectivity of the subaltern, perhaps. The lacuna of the voice of the gendered subaltern or marginalized figure from the literary compendium left no space for the nationalists, except the deliberate misrecognition of Thakurma. In order to fulfill this gigantic ambitious project of identifying the peripheral Deshojo characters, nationalist writers required much time to trace the carefully constructed historiography of the subaltern. They concurrently had to fasten the paradoxes of time knot or Shomai Granthi, which left India dwelling with multiple centuries at the same time. To use Marx's terminology, this unresolved question thus so far deals with the problem of leaving out the stagism before corresponding to universal suffrage and political modernity by provincializing Europe and assimilating Western liberal concepts such as nation, history, civilization, Indian elite intelligentsia aspired to proclaim the national heritage without even, without even possessing the sufficient recognitive relationship with the marginalized. To justify the need of the significant depiction, the quest for recognition resulted into a hurried or sometimes completely fabricated romantic imaginary portrayal of the other. However, this lacuna of authenticity is not an inherent characteristic in the field of the hermeneutics. It is also enormously interconnected with the problem of semantics, in relation to which 19th century Bengal had to undergo a colossal change in historicity. By history, I adhere to the Heideggerian concept of deep history, a sense of continuity in the historical forces, which by opposing the idea of history or mere chronological description of the past events does not lie behind us as something long past, but stands before us. So the 19th century colonial project of modernity, which ratified the standardization of the Bangla language that reshaped and urbanized the colloquial language with the advent of print technology and the socio-cultural disciplines can be perceived as historical since it also had the identical and indistinguishable consequences of the translation of Greek language into Latin, where the pre-ontological sense experience were occupied by the rules of imperium, that is, to establish, to make arrangements. For instance, Bengali syntax punctuation marks borrowed laboriously from the paternal European grammatical models, and the structural conflict between the rustic colloquial and the chaste formality commenced a wide range of textual aporia, common to the 19th century Bengali prose. Partho Chatterjee, in one of his pioneering essay, A Religion of Urban Domesticity, Sri Ramakrishna and the Calcutta Middle Class, analyzed the structure of Kothamrito, which bore simultaneously the conceptual richness, metaphoric power, dialectic skill of Sri Ramakrishna's utterance speech act, and systematic archivization of those words into the modern European discourse by Mahendranath Gupta. Also, this productionist strain in the Bengali language was an outcome of colonial institutional experimentation to aid the administrative work in vernacular by producing the bilingual lexicons that also standardized the Bengali font as a matter of fact, so that 19th century learners could acquire instructions whether it is educational or vocational, with the assistance of translation method, which is still in practice in the rural semi-urban schools, where teachers read, for example, Jol Mane Water. Here then, enabled by repetitive practice of Mane Bolo, like say the meaning, and reading Porano, an untranslatable expression in Bengali, um, using Spivak's words here, a discrete spelling exercise to be read in a high drone with little regard to punctuation. At a rudimentary at the kindergarten school level, the vernacular lost its own trail of signifier signified in relation to its being, the same in this case. The linguistic projector mapping, however, did not only confine itself within the parameter of epistemic violence. It also subordinated vernaculars from their geographical boundary through the universalization of school book text, 
in ways that instigated rupture untraceable in the myriad network of subaltern speeches in the later period. Now I have arrived at the concluding part of my paper. The major axis of my interpretation of archive rests on Dar Darida's pioneering text, Archive Fever, where he formulated the archontic function of consignation, that is to say, gerrymandering and altering phallogocentric toponomological signs, which took place at the archeon, a house, a domicile, an address, the residence of the superior magistrates, from where the process of commencement and commandment emanate. But this teleological project of archival mapping in the 19th century Bengal had no solitary power knowledge nexus. Rather, it was a complex wave of institutional networks, be it occidental or oriental mode of knowledge production. As an example, one can consider East producing knowledge to resist West, West producing knowledge to subordinate East, and even East producing knowledge to serve the West. Each living multiple trades, which can initiate seismic deconstruction of each designated telos. Henceforth, simultaneous rereading and the restructuring of the patriarchy, a term to designate the authoritative patriarchal nature of the archive, have an Oedipal anxiety with the 19th century archival project, which deserves a separate study of its own. The anatomy of the 19th century archive, then, has this rhizomatic structure marked by ceaselessly established connections between semiotic chains, organizations of power, and circumstances relative to the art, sciences, and social struggles, as opposed to an arborescent hierarchical genealogy to trace. Archive, then as prior mentioned, is an assemblage of multitudinous textuality, a body without organs that is assembling, juxtaposing, disorganizing, dismantling, and then allowing the signifiers to rupture the semantic ad infinitum. Thank you. Thank you, Ogniva. Uh, I just forgot, uh, I, I, I have not asked for your introduction. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, uh, my name is Ogniva Maiti, and I'm, uh, I'm doing my PhD from North Bengal University, and also a junior research fellow here, there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, we will take questions at the end of the session. So the third and last presenter of this session is uh, Camellia Buiraghu. And the title of our paper is Sports and the Bengali Cultural Identity, the Case of Colonial Bengal. May I request Camellia to uh, switch on her video and to unmute herself. Please add a brief introduction before you start reading your paper. Uh, good evening, everyone. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are. Okay, sir. Uh, is it loud and clear? Yes, it's it's clear. Okay, we sir. are not getting your video. Sir, so actually, due to a network error, if I switch on the video more, then maybe uh, okay, it okay, will get okay. very Got much it. disturbed. Got it. So Got uh, it, it no has problem. been running for four hours now. <laughs> okay, sir. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Um, sir, uh, I am a PhD research scholar in the Department of English uh, of Vishwabharati University, Shantiniketan. Uh, the paper that I have chosen to discuss uh, is entitled as Sports and the Bengali Cultural Identity, the Case of Colonial Bengal. Now, although I am a student of literature, I have chosen to uh, talk about a completely different uh, field. And I hope this is, although quite a different field, but this is a very interesting uh, aspect for all of us. Uh, sir, is my presentation visible on the screen? Uh, is there no. anything on the screen? No, uh, not right okay, now. Okay, okay, okay. Just a moment. Is it visible, sir, by now? Is there anything? Yes, yes, yes. Slides? Yes. 
Yes, it's visible. Okay, thank you it's so visible. much. Thank you so much for your co cooperation. And thanks to the organizers as well, before I forget. Well, uh, uh, I will not go in an elaborate discussion of the paper as today, this is my, uh, this is, I am the last speaker and I know that uh, we are more than exhausted. Our, our, our devices are exhausted and the internet packs are almost running for th more than three hours. I will just go through these slides and add on few lines. This is more of a historical research on, on the, on the uh, development of, of the distinct uh, cultural identity that sports has have had in Bengal. Not not only Bengal but India as well. Since this seminar was, this webinar is about the Bengali cultural identity, I have chosen to talk about Bengal in this aspect. Now, as far as sports is concerned, from child's play to the Olympics, what conscious and unconscious level of our imagination through various different modes of recreation, games, pastimes played in our childhood. The East India Company, the English who landed in India in the, uh, I think, 17th century, had their culture brought along with them. Now, sports has always been an important part in the British culture as well. Theirs being a cold country and perhaps colder than us to a, to a greater degree, their sports culture was significantly different from that of ours. The introduction of European sports, the introduction of English sports, particularly in Bengal, started happening as soon as the English people landed on the banks of rivers in order to carry on with their trade. Formally speaking, it happened with the establishment of various sporting clubs and Bengal, our very own Kolkata, is one of the leading figures in this aspect. It was in February 17. 92 or perhaps few years before 17, <clears throat> 1792 uh, when the when the coming of being coming into being of the calcutta cricket club made by the east india company marked the beginning of something greater than what we could have that that than that they could have perhaps perceived at that point of time in january 1804 a two day grand match of cricket between the old etonians employed by the east india company and a team representing calcutta took place in kolkata then there was the royal calcutta golf club of 1829, the Calcutta Rowing Club in 1858, the Calcutta Football Club of 1872, mostly interested in playing rugby, consisting mostly of whites, which had British administrators, rulers, soldiers, and other English immigrants and their family members. Now, Rono Joy Shane in his Nation at uh, Play sorry has to be remarked that Camellia. the Camellia. culture introduced by the British, Camellia. perhaps mostly by the English, marked Hello. a sanctuary of English life Hello. in Hello. an Camellia. Indian environment in the form of, of informal Sports, Hello. gaming, and recreational. Hello, Camellia. Can you hear me? Now, Can you hear you me, Colonia? Into a, 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 a brief. Yes. Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. Hello. Can you hear me, Camellia? Yes. Yes. We cannot see, see the slides. The chair was trying to alert you. Uh, Dr. Mondal, please. Uh, uh, if you could. Yes. Camellia, yes, would you like to restart the slides? Would you like to restart the slides? Yes, you are audible, but slides are not visible always. Yes, sir. 
would you like to restart it the slides please restart the slides hello i think you need to stop presenting and then start the uh, uh, slide presentation yes. once more sir. that will yes. help yes sir hello hello yes yes what, sir am what, i audible doctor, yes audible but what doctor yes sir Mondali i can hear you yes, yes doctor mondal is hear trying you. doctor mondal is trying i can hear you sir no problem no, it's not hearing i can hear you it's sir it's not hearing problem uh, you are audible perfectly but but yes, uh, we cannot see the presentation would you would you please stop presentation and then restart the presentation Okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, okay, please. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. I'm trying. Sir, are they there? Are they visible now? No. Are no. They <laughs> visible now? No. Can you see the slides by now? Uh, Hello. Not right now. Hello. We cannot Hello? see the slides. Hello. Uh, Hello. Well, I think there are some network issues. Should Hello. Not hear us properly. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Ah, uh, I think better you you read out the paper without without uh, using all those slides. That would be better. Yes, yes, your slides are there. Your slides are there. I think she needs to unmute herself, maybe. Maybe there are some network issues. She cannot hear us properly. Camelia, please unmute yourself. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Well, some kind, is it okay? Some kind of technical glitches. I request okay. the audience yes, uh, sir, is to it okay? be patient. Yes, it is okay. It is okay. Uh, it is okay. Hello. Please carry on. Hello. Hi. Yes, it is sir, okay. I can Please carry on. Hear you, but can you hear? Yes. Yes, we me? can hear you. We can hear you. Please carry on. So, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Please start reading your paper. Please start reading your paper. It, it is okay. So can, can yes, it is okay. It is okay. We can hear my you. Audible? Yes, yes. Yes, you are audible. You are audible. Your presentation is visible. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, visible. So please are the carry slides on. over there? Yes, slides are there. Okay. 
ओके सर थैंक प्लीज कैरी थैंक यू ओके सो द प्री कनोल द द नेक्स्ट स्लाइड दैट आई हैव इफ एट ऑल इज विजिबल टू ऑल आई विल ओके थैंक यू इट इज अबाउट द प्री कनोल कॉलोनियल यस सर आई एम डूइंग सो it is about the pre colonial versus the post colonial scene in the pre colonial era so i am reading in sir you should baba ओके थैंक यू सो मच द कॉलोनियल गेम कल गेम्स एंड स्पोर्ट्स इंक्लूडेड इंक्लूडेड हॉर्स राइडिंग चेरी एटसेट्रा द इंग्लिश आर चेंज प्लेस इन द इन द फॉर्स द क्लब कल्चर नेसेसरीली एडेड द आइडिया institute now of what have of institutionalization uh, by the what stay previously lose uh, free at games uh, as of a kind of uh, process of free was and yet enjoy followed at the same time these do of enjoy I mean that it not tools the Doctor Mondol, I think uh, Camellia Boyago has lost her connection. Yes, I think so. I think so. Uh, so, what may... to do? Should I end the session? Uh, I think uh, it is better to end the session now, and uh, because she was presenting from her smartphone, that is why uh, I think the pro problem uh, arise. Okay. Okay. so uh, still now we have one question it's from monalisha mukherjee and directed towards stella chitrolekha vishwas uh, chitrolekha can you hear me yes sir i can hear you yes yes you can you can also see the question in the yes, uh, chat box uh, yes, the question the is question. in rokia husain's sultana's dream did the writer suggest emasculation for muslim men or also for hindu men or men of other faiths or communities yes uh, what i have gathered from my uh, study and research on dr shafawat hussain is that she was uh, throughout her active years she was specifically involved with the cause of muslim women uh, a cause which she saw was not really adequately represented within the larger women question in colonial bengal something that i already mentioned at the beginning of my paper so uh, what she particularly targeted both in her own social uh, social activist uh, works as well as in her own writings be it in the realms of uh, fact i mean in the realms of factual writings or fictive writings she specifically targeted uh, you know uh, the patriarchal counterparts of fundamentalist islam that is uh, the men who were trying to deliberately curb a uh, woman who had from expanding and expressing their own scope their own potential for development uh, you know uh, she particularly crusaded against all of the biases that she saw was uh, you know uh, kind of curbing down women's freedom uh, be it in the form of confinement in the zanana or the observation of parda 
or the denial of women of the various rights of education, other employment opportunities and so on. So uh, what I have understood is that she was particularly targeting Muslim men and not really men from other communities as per se. While also you might read under the, under the lines and see her critiquing uh, the larger patrol class as well, the intelligentsia who were involved with the project of social reform, the project of nationalism, because she did not see the cause of Muslim women being adequ adequately represented within the woman question. So that is something yeah. now. Uh, we don't have uh, any other question. Ognivo, are you there? I have I have a small observation for you. Uh, or, or, yes, sir. Perhaps uh, I'm going to suggest you something, uh, taking the privilege yes, sir, of the uh, chair. Uh, what I found, your paper is a bit misnomer. You are talking about, your, the title speaks, it's about cartographic project. Yes, sir. What I understand, it deals with something map-related things. But you, you mostly speak about archive. And yes, sir. Uh, what I perceive from your paper that you lack some basic reading of 19th century colonial Bengal. It's not all that Partho Chatterjee thing or all the theories you need to know the time. Uh, I can suggest you a few books if yes, you sir, contact please. me. Uh, it's uh, by David Koff. It's by Shushobhan Sarkar. Shumit Sarkar has wonderful uh, book on this period. Then yes. Shishir Kumar Shrin. All they have contributedly, uh, all they have contributed very rich thing to understand the time. So your paper is not uh, up to the mark at, the, at that level. And it's a bit misnomer. Don't use that much jargon. Yes, jargon is necessary. But you need to know the time. You know, need to know the meaning of all these jargons. Only jargons and jargons and circumlocutory way of speaking. You cannot reach anywhere. That is my humble suggestion. Please don't mind. No, no, I'm sir. just Definitely. trying to. Yes, yes. Thank uh, you. So, so, so I'm going to end this session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, the audience, for your patience. Thank you, uh, the organizers, for giving opportunity to the young researcher. I'm very sorry for Camellia Boiraggo. Uh, there are some technical glitches and network issues. I think. Uh, she she can uh, present her paper in in uh, next few days, uh, next two days, if the organizers can accommodate it. And thank you once again. I hand over to uh, hand over this session to Ramanuj. Thank you, Dr. Mondal, uh, and and really, uh, uh, Dr. Mondal, uh, whom I uh, normally call. Jyotida has been a crucial person in organizing this webinar. Thank you so much. And thanks to the paper presenters, uh, uh, Stella Chitrodilekha Bishash, uh, Ognigo Maiti, and Camellia Boiraggo also. Uh, Camellia was trying to present a screen from her smartphone. So that's uh, uh, where the problem occurred, I think. So uh, if you are trying to present your screen, you should mm, uh, be using, uh, you sh it is better that you, you should be using uh, a computer or a laptop maybe. So we have come to the end of the day one. And may I now request my colleague, uh, uh, Amor Dofakto, faculty uh, at the Department of English of Centenary College to uh, deliver the vote of thanks for day one. Amor, please. Amor, we cannot hear you. No, the sound is not clear. No, we cannot hear you. Maybe, maybe you could leave the meeting and join again, join back again. That might help.
Amor, we cannot hear you. Maybe you could, yes. In the meanwhile, I'll just uh, share uh, the uh, uh, sh schedule. Uh, yes, Amor is back. Is he? Yes, he is back. Om Amor, can you turn your, yes. Unmute yourself. Um, uh, unmute yourself, yes, yes. Am I now? Yes, yes, now, now it's, it's better, better than earlier, yeah. Okay, good evening to all the, all presented here. It gives me an immense pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks to all the dignitaries assembled here for the first evening of this Young Researchers International Webinar on the Evolution of Bengali Identity, Reflections in Literature, Culture, and Society. We thank. We take this golden opportunity to thank our honorable keynote speaker, Dr. Nondini Bhattacharya, Professor of English, Department of English and Culture Studies, the University of Bardwan, for her illuminating thoughts and insights to unearth some of the unknown ideas on Bengali identities in Bongim Chandra Chattopadhyay and Monika Ali. I would like to thank Dr. Sandeep Kumar Bashak, respected principal of Sarat Centenary College, for always being with us and supporting us to organize such uh, academic activities. I extend my gratitude to Dr. Ramanuj Konar, Assistant Professor of English, Sarat Centenary College, and the editor of Postscriptum, an interdisciplinary journal of literary studies, uh, as well as the chief organizer of this webinar for his immense contribution, without which it would not be possible for us to assemble here. I cordially thank Dr. Shraboni Banerjee, Associate Professor of English, Triveni Devi, Bhatwaliya College, and Dr. Jyoti Shankar Mondol, Assistant Professor of English, Siddhartha University, uh, for giving their valuable time uh, and shared the two sessions. We remain grateful to all the paper presenters for presenting their varieties of ideas on Bengali identities to enrich all of us. Last but not the least, I thank the audience of this webinar for keeping their presence and raising some questions, as well as I like to thank the viewers on who are watching the live streaming of this webinar on our Facebook page. Once again, I thank one and all presented here, and thus we end this program here, and we'll meet again tomorrow afternoon with new researchers and new ideas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Omar. And uh, as we say uh, goodbye, we uh, I'm going to just share the schedule for tomorrow. Uh, so you can see it here on the screen. So yes, it's coming. Yes, now it's visible. So so you can uh, see that we have three uh, business sessions where uh, twelve paper presenters uh, will be presenting their ideas and. Most importantly, we have Dr. Dipendu Dash, Professor of English and uh, Dean of uh, Shuniti Kumar Chattopadhyay School of English and Foreign Language Studies from Asham University, Silchar, who will be uh, uh, speaking as one of our distinguished invited speakers. Goodbye, everyone. See you again tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful session. Thank you for being here, everyone. Thank you so much.